fall, uh, we used to offset the utility bills for this firehouse to relieve the burden on the taxpayer. So if you're thinking of having an event, please consider us. I would appreciate it. Um, and welcome. My name is Robert Napoli. I spent 20 years in, uh, in state and local government, 20 years in private business. Uh, I've seen the ins and outs of, of government. Uh, I've worked for the Department of Community Affairs for many, many years. Uh, and I've sat on many boards and commissions. I served as a councilman and currently um, the vice president of this fire company. Uh, I've witnessed, you know, the good and bad in government. And uh, I've, worked, I've, I've witnessed the miracles of what good government can do for the people. And I've witnessed, all right, the humility and the shame of what a bad government can do. Uh, uh, likewise, I believe that newspapers try in the best interest to represent the truth in reporting. Um, however, sometimes if you, well, Oprah's a very good tool. Uh, if you want more information, you Oprah that document. Now, I was misquoted in the paper, unfortunately, because uh, Thomas Jefferson once said that advertisements can contain only the truth and uh, to be relied on only in the newspaper. Uh, but James Madison uh, wrote, basically, knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and those who need to be their own governors should arm themselves with all the power that knowledge could give. Um, Henry Clay, Henry Clay uh, I'm sorry, Henry Clay, uh, one of the five greatest senators, um, who was one of the founding fathers also of this country, he said government is a trust, and the officers of that government are trustees, and both the trust and the trustees were created for the benefit of the people. Um, the founding fathers certainly must have had some infinite wisdom, because in 2002, January 8th of 2002, uh, the legislature uh, became law under uh, Open Public Records Act. And uh, since then, there's been many changes. There's been uh, case law on the subject. There's been a lot of GRC uh, uh, changes and uh, recommendations. And I think tonight, that's what we're here to explain to all of you, uh, right, what those differences are and what those changes are. Now, without further ado, let me please uh, introduce the, uh, the panel tonight. John Path, when I met John Path, I, I first had some communication with him. I actually thought he was a law professor. Um, the man is a brilliant man. He writes impeccably. Um, and when I personally met him, I found out he was just a common citizen like you and I, a firefighter, a great guy. But Mr. Pear, uh is, uh, is is an interesting individual. He's done more for this state, uh, for openness, than I know of any other individual that I've ever met in both state and public government. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Path has made some real great strides. Uh, personally, he's made he's uh, he's done it at his own personal cost in a lot of cases. Uh, John uh, has been labeled in certain areas as the uh, sunshine troublemaker, but uh, I kind of like that. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's uh, been. Uh, in, in court many, many times. Uh, and one of them right here in Monmouth County, which was an interesting case with uh, settlement agreements with particularly uh, <coughs> counties that make personnel se settlement agreements on uh, uh, outside of the public view. And I think that uh, we were represented by Mr. Lors and we had won that particular case. Uh, however, Mr. Path has been so active and uh, so successful for so long, it's hard, it's very hard to find anybody in this state that can equal what Mr. Path has done. Uh, so it's with great pride that I introduce you to John Path. Thank you. Michael Perone also is an advocate for open, open government, and uh, he specializes in collecting information, uh, obtaining them for the websites, uh, and uh, getting this information from public agencies to disseminate to the public. Um, he provides these databases uh, for the public's use, and uh, with that, I think, Michael, uh, it would be a lot difficult to find information if it weren't for his talent. Uh, Michael? Uh, and how do I describe Walter? Walter, um, I met Walter uh, uh, through uh, 
through litigation. Um, I hired Walter as my own attorney and represent me in certain matters with several municipalities. Um, he's the acting director of New Jersey Fog. Uh, he successfully represented me and, and other litigants in Monmouth County and other counties in the state. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, there's probably no better legal authority in this state that, uh, that is recognized other than Walter Lawrence. His offices are in Oxford, New Jersey. And uh, I'd like to introduce you and turn over the microphone now to Walter Lawrence. Mayor, Bob, thank you very much for those, for those gracious words. Um, the, uh, the format here tonight is, is very simple. Uh, John and Mike and I will talk about the Open Public Records Act. But importantly, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt us at any time. We feel that the evening and the conversation goes much smoother if we can incorporate your questions and your concerns in what we say. So if as we're talking, if thoughts pop into your head or whatever you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, we'll stop what we're saying, and we'll talk about it because we much would we'd much rather have a conversation with you rather than have us um, drone, you know, drone on and on. Uh, and with that, I'll give it over. I mean, I'll I'll moderate a little bit, but I'll give it over to John, and John will talk a little bit about the Old Public Records Act. Okay. Yeah. You know, one of two ways that you can get records in New Jersey is through the Open Public Records Act. The other way is through the common law right of access. Prior to the Open Public Records Act, which was passed, the OPRA, in 2002, we had a thing called the Right to Know Law. The Right to Know Law was deficient in several respects. Two notable deficiencies were that there, were, there was no time limit within which the government had to get back to you after you made a request. So the governments predictably would just never get back to you in response to the request. And, you would, and that, that brings us to the second deficiency, which is that if you were to sue a government agency because of their failure to respond to their denial of a request, you were not able to get attorney's fees in excess of $500. So what would happen is the requester would be faced with this dilemma where they would go out and get an attorney to cost them maybe $3,000 or $4,000 in order to get a record and only be able to recover legally only up to $500 if they, if they were successful in their lawsuit. Clearly it was unsatisfactory and, uh, and, the, and the record custodians around the state took advantage of that. They knew the position of the citizen requester and they knew it wasn't worth hundreds of dollars to most, to most citizens to actually just prevail and get a record. So uh, it, was a, it was a woefully inadequate law. The inadequacies, I believe, out of that came Oprah. And two of the more important provisions, a lot of details of Oprah and, and, and what kind of records, and there's a lot of differences. But the one thing that you can get, the one thing is that they have a seven business day period of time within which they must respond. So if you put a request into a, to a municipality or a school board or any other agency or a state agency, they have to, within seven business days, either grant your request, deny your request, or they have to ask for an extension of time or clarification of the request. If they fail to get back to you within seven business days, it is considered a deemed denial. It is the same as them denying the request. And then you can take them to court, or you can take them to the Government Records Council. Well, the second thing is that there is no limit on the amount of attorney's fees you can recover. Attorney's fees for a successful Oprah litigant are mandatory. The court has to award you the attorney's fees if, you, if your records request was instrumental in bringing about the record, whether you do it through a settlement or whether you get a judgment of the court. So it's a very powerful tool because you can ask for a record and you're, you're forcing the government to give you some sort of a response within seven business days. And if they fail to do that at all, you can, you can hire an attorney. Now the way the attorney will work on this, and, and, and typically water and there's other attorneys that do the same thing, is they take the case on contingency. The idea being that they get paid if and only if the government agency pays them. So as the client, you're generally not on the hook for any out-of-pocket expenses as far as attorney's fees. Most attorneys will probably want you to pay the $200 filing fee for the, for the uh, or the $230 filing fee, I should say, for the order to show cause in Superior Court, but you would get that back if you prevail. So you would get cost and attorney's fees. So it gives the citizen requester a very powerful tool. 
Now, the other part of it, and what Oprah, like the Right to Know Law, did, is it specifically reserved the common law right to, to access records. New Jersey is a common law state, meaning that we recognize, unless it was it had been abrogated by a statute or a court decision, the courts in this state will recognize pre-1776 colonial law and the law from Great Britain as being the common law. And under the common law, you have a separate distinct right in order to get records. So the common law is not like Oprah. Oprah, Oprah is like an on-off switch. If you ask for a record, they have to give it to you, regardless of your reasons for wanting it, unless there's a specific exemption that says that they don't have to give it to you. If the exemption applies, you don't get the record under Oprah. Under the common law, even if you're not entitled to the record under Oprah, under the common law, you have a right to the record to the extent that your interest in needing it as a, as a private interest or a public interest in needing the record is greater than the government's need to retain the record confidentiality. So, like, in, uh, like for instance, the Oprah says that the common law will apply even to criminal investigatory records which are exempt under Oprah. So if you ask for a criminal investigatory record such as a a police report or, 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 or something that a, a record kept by a police agency, even if they deny it under Oprah, you still have a separate right. If you can show that your interest in that record is greater than their interest in keeping it confidential, you can prevail under the common law. Now recently, in the case of Mason versus Hoboken, the court made a pretty astonishing statement. The Supreme Court of New Jersey said that you, you get, even if you win under the common law right of access and not under Oprah, you're still entitled to recover your attorney's fees. And that's huge, because a lot of the records are exempt under Oprah, and some of the more interesting cases are those where the citizen is trying to say, I have a better right or a more, a more, a higher or a better right in the record than you have to keep it confidential. And I just had a case like that in Union County, and we're, we're pursuing attorney's fees. The case was a, um, a videotape of a police officer in uniform um, trespassing using his key to go in Garwood Borough and, and, and go around and, and into, the, into the borough and poke around and look and file in cabinets and drawers when he wasn't supposed to be there. And I wanted to get a copy of the video so I could put it on YouTube. Garwood, of course, said no. And we fought it and we won. And it was considered a criminal investigatory record and thus exempt under Oprah. But it was considered a common law record because the borough couldn't come up with a reason why they needed to keep it confidential in, in light of the public's interest in seeing what this officer actually did. So we currently have a, a motion pending for Judge Brock and we're, we're seeking attorney's fees. And I'd like to get that case, if we win that case, it'll show an actual example where you can win under the common law and actually get fees. But as far as Oprah goes, uh, essentially every record, any record that is required to be made or any record that's not what really, that was the old right to know law standard required to be, but any record that is on file on, in any government office is a government record, except for some exceptions. Those exceptions would be things like criminal investigatory records, certain personnel records, uh, and there's a whole list of them, and there's a booklet up here that people can take that, that, that has the, the entire text, and it, it'll, it'll explain what, what over, what the exceptions are, but essentially, if you're interested in any in any issue, that's what you want to do. You want to file an open request to the agency and ask them for a copy of the record that would express or would, would reveal the documents that you would reveal the information that you're looking for. What's what's the correct way to file an open request? Uh, the correct way to file an open request. First off, you don't have to use their government form. That's a, that was a big uh, people really underestimate the importance of that decision. Uh, there was, this was, this, the decision was Tina Renna versus County of Union, and uh, they, it was the, the opinion of the Government Records Council, which is the state agency <coughs> that, that enforces Oprah, that you had to use each agency's specific form in order to make a request. I live in Somerset, New Jersey. Suppose, and routinely I would make requests in, you know, in, in this area. So let's say I wanted to go to a, a town, not like Bradley Beach, but a town, you know, with a, a nice town like Bradley Beach, where they're very open. But another time, I won't mention any names. And, 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 <laughs> and you, you asked for, I said, I want, to make, I want to make a record. They said, well, you have to make the record on our form. Well, how do I get a copy of your form? It's not on your website for download. Well, you have to request from us the form. Well, how do I do that? Well, give me your address or send me, I've had this, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope in the mail, and we will then return the form to you that you can then complete in order to have 
that is, 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 is it's, it's, a, it's ridiculous to have to, to have to request the request form from, from a municipality. But this is, but sometimes this is the way some of these people play. I mean, I'm, I'm going to throw out and say it, a lot of the towns, I mean, I mean, there are several towns that they're not really playing in good faith. I mean, this is a, a situation where they're making mistakes and they don't understand Oprah and they don't understand. They, have a, they don't have a commitment toward the open government philosophy. They, they, and I think part of the reason is, is, dare I say that there is corruption in New Jersey, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the towns who are, are and the, the towns that are populated with officials who are corrupt are gener generally not interested in having their corruption exposed. And what they, yes sir? Uh, I'm availing his invitation to interrupt. Uh, sorry, um, I live in Asbury Park 14 years, and you want to pick a corrupt town, I live there, Asbury Park is corrupt. Now, I requested some information. Um, my question is, what if they give you the wrong information that's not what you requested, but it looks similar? I request some information on some money specifically given to the city by Bruce Springsteen to use for a community center. So they came back in two weeks, by the way, but anyway, they came back with this stuff about 25000 that he'd given for a park and had some things about some uh, stuff he supplies that they bought with it and this and that, but it wasn't even the actual request I had made. But how do I deal with that? Because I gave them, uh, I didn't know the exact date they gave it, but I gave them the year, approximately a year, and they knew what I was talking about, but they just pulled one over on me and gave me the wrong information. No, that happens a lot with people where they play hide the ball. Exactly. Um, they, 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 like, I, I'm, I'm talking to these people and, and they know that what I'm looking for is the the resolution 3807, and I'll say, well, there was a resolution, I think it started with 38. I had a 7 in some place, and I, I was trying to, and it had to do with this, and they'll just look at me, and I'll go, hmm. They just, they don't act as if they don't know what I want. But what you do, and what I do, and it seems to work, well, first off, under Mason versus Hoboken, the Supreme Court told that re records requesters and the custodians are supposed to cooperate with each other. It's not supposed to be a game of hide the ball. It's supposed to be, well, Try to get the guy what he wants. Try to, you know, work with him. So what I do is I will make a record request and they read like a novel. I had I start off with background. You know, I heard, I understand that sometime back in 2007 or 2008 or thereabouts, uh, Bruce Springsteen gave a certain amount of money uh, to the city to be used for that. And I, I, I would, you know, and then he would then say that, you know, I'm interested in finding out how this uh, money was spent. I don't know exactly when he gave the money, but it was a large sum of money. I think that you probably would remember it. I need your help, city clerk, in that's Mr. K, uh, to to help me get the information that I want. And I don't, and I, and I'm very genuinely, I'm sincere that I, I want them to help me. And when you, when you, sometimes they will be convinced by that, and they will actually will help you. They'll help me. Sometimes what they're doing is they're recognizing, they're predicting how horrible it will look in front of a superior court judge to see in the record this genuine, sincere request for assistance in locating a public record that they and only they have knowledge of. You know it exists, but you can't cite the, the exact, you know, the, the, the chapter and verse on it. And they recognize that they will look very mean-spirited and very unopened government if, if, if they see how many times that you can, and you have a whole paper trail that you're asking for this record, maybe, you know, and then they're not, then they're just very brusquely just refusing you, saying, well, we don't know what you're talking about. So, unfortunately, they probably push, come, to shove, can get away with, if you can't specify with any degree of accuracy what record you're looking for, they, they probably could push, they probably could, they probably could get away with that. But, 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 my experience is that if you if you ask them and you sh and you give as much information as you have and you explain to them that you don't really know exactly what record you're looking for and that you want them to help you, they generally will. So I'd give that a shot. Sure, absolutely. I had a similar situation uh, while back. I was trying to get uh, check register information from the county of Warren. Uh, I wanted to uh, put My together. Get that, yeah. Okay. Get a little closer to the microphone. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I had a similar situation uh, while well, back trying to get uh, check register information from the County of Warren. I, I wanted to get a list of all the checks that they wrote, who they wrote the check to, what purchase order their check was written against, the date that the check was written, the check number, 
uh, any coverage numbers, and of course the amount of uh, the check. And at that time, I didn't know as much about doing this as I do now, but they, they told me, well, we don't have that information in the format that you want. So we'll have to hire a, uh, an engineer to play a program to give the data to you in the format that you want. And, and I, at that time, I paid for that to happen. But now, when I'm in a in similar circumstance, if someone says to me that they don't have the information that I want, uh, in this instance, what I did was, uh, what I do now, is I'll go and I'll Oprah the manual, the operating manual for the software that they're using to keep the data. And that, um, the table of contents here. So I start with the table of contents. I look for the reports that are that are in that table of contents, and then I can ask specifically for the report that has the information that I'm looking for. Would you repeat that? It's the Oprah manual for what? Not the open manual, the user manual for the software that they're using to keep the records. And I ask for the table of contents, and I look for the reports. And very often you'll see reports that relate to the information that you're trying to request. So if you're getting, if, you're not, if you have someone who's not terribly helpful, this is a way to get that help despite all their, 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 uh, their animus. And, uh, and I've found that to be very successful. Let them it. Just the user manual for whatever computer software package that they're using in order to generate whatever documents. That, that's that's another is, is is a lot of times it's really a lot more helpful to have information in electronic format than it is to have in paper format, uh, especially financial. Yeah, Doc. What do you do um, if there's obvious or blatant errors and omissions in such a check register as a person's record? I just went through that again with the county of Warren. I, back in 2008, I requested all the checks that they write. And uh, they gave me a, a list of checks. They refused to give me the checks that they were writing for their employees. And at the time, I thought it was just because they didn't want me to know what they were paying their employees. I, I, since then, I, I've come to a different conclusion. Uh, as it turned out, they had two separate bank accounts using the same set of sequence numbers. And by not giving me the, the employee numbers, anything that was missing in the sequence that I had, I would naturally assume well, it must be in the data that I wasn't given. That was not the case. But what I found after, after getting the, the uh, winning our case of the GRC, Walter uh, won that for me uh, a little over a year later, when I got the other data, I saw all these duplicate check numbers. I'm going, well, this doesn't make sense. You can't have two checks, 2003 and 2000. So, yes, they admitted that they had two separate bank accounts. And then I said, well, this is a separate bank account. Where are all these missing checks? And that, that's when they started admitting to me that they hadn't given me all the checks that I had requested. So we had, this was fresh off of victory, uh, getting the, the, the records. And I went back and I said, look, you know, my goal here is not to beat you up in public and win lawsuits. I just want to get the data that I'm requesting. So I'm going to uh, resubmit my request and ask you to, this time, if you're going to omit a check number, I want to know why it's been omitted. It should be redacted, and I should be given a reason for the redaction. Uh, and, and please give me all of the, the uh, check numbers. And they agreed. So we went back, and they redid the data, and I just recently got the, uh, the data map. There's still problems. There's still a few missing checks, and what I'll probably have to do there is make an open request for the missing check numbers. But I'm not specific to what to ask for, and then we'll see where that where that takes us. What, what was the reason for them omitting the numbers or the checks? <laughs> well, uh, the reason I was told that, uh, that some of the checks were not given to me was that they were voided checks. Uh, well, we didn't give you any of the voided checks. And I said, well, there's way too many checks to just be voided checks unless you're just writing checks and every third or fourth one you avoid it. Uh, then they said, well, we didn't want to give you the checks that we write to the poll workers because, you know, it's hard enough to get people to do poll workers without telling us uh, what you're doing. And, I, and my response to them was simply, well, just quote the statute that you're using to not give me the poll worker checks. Yes, sir. But, but they have to report them to email. <coughs> yeah, yeah. And, and well, actually, you know, the, the, what, what started this role... Poll or poll? The, electric poll? The, no, no, the poll electric worker, people poll, who work the, the, the electoral polls. It has to go to the electric law enforcement But it, the truth is, they simply didn't want me to have all the checks. <laughs> yeah. Those are important checks. 
in, in that particular example, would you have been able to request their bank statement, which usually has sequential check numbers, the amount, and probably the image of the check? Yes, so and that's exactly so that would come what I was told was that if I wanted to pursue that, they yeah. could provide that information to me, uh, but they would have to go back to the bank to get the, the uh, images. Right. And, and actually, the, uh, the way that, that I first got wind that, this, that there was something wrong was uh, a woman in my, uh, my little tea party group was concerned about the local uh, nursing home that it, it, she felt it had been going downhill for a couple of years and her aunt was in the nursing home. So she asked me to run a check register on the nursing home, which I did. And the nursing home data was duplicative of the data that I had asked. It's a subset of that data because the Warren County government writes the checks for the nursing home. So when I compared the two records, I saw checks in the one set of check data that didn't appear in the other set. Uh, and I also noticed that, for example, there were vendors missing in the checking register data that I got from the nursing home that I got from the county in, the, uh, in 2008. So the registry request I made in 2010, in April 2010, I, I, I was finding checks that weren't there. And, and if you, for anyone who's interested in doing this, one of the very first things that you should look at if you do go get a check register database is put, sort the checks by check number order and look for missing checks. Very important. Can you get the bank statements? Yes, they are. The monthly statements? There's, there's no exemption for it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, then, if you don't have to use, really use the form, <coughs> can you simply write a letter to them? How do you... Uh, well, the, 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 the example I use is that you can use a paper napkin. You can use anything. It has, it has to be in writing. I mean, well, it's, it's an extreme example, but the extreme example proves the point, which is that the only requirement is that the OPRA request be in writing and that it reference OPRA. It's a good idea to, to mention OPRA. I mean, I could probably work around that if it went to court, but it should, it should say this request is being made pursuant to the Old Public Records Act, and then ask, and, and then list what you want. Uh, and that's, and that's the, you know, the flip side of that coin is, you know, we talked a little bit about how do you make a request the request has to be in writing, and it doesn't have to be on a form. Then the question is, well, who do you give it to? You know, theoretically, in the state of New Jersey, if you give your OPRA request to a public employee, that, a pub that public employee has a responsibility under OPRA to do one of two things. They have to either give the OPRA request to the records custodian, or they have to direct you to the records custodian. So theoretically, if, and this isn't my example, this is the example of the, the director of the Government Records Council. Theoretically, if you hand in an OPRA request to a, to a guy taking tolls, collecting tolls on the turnpike or the parkway, they would have to either direct you to the correct records custodian, or they'd have to forward that OPRA request to, to the correct person. Now again, it's an extreme example, but that's what the law says. So. If you're writing a letter to an agency and you say, you know, dear sir, uh, dear uh, records custodian, um, under Oprah I request the following records, and you list them X, Y, and Z, let's say that letter doesn't get to the right person. That right person still has the responsibility. I see your hand. That right person, that person still has the responsibility to either get back to you and say, okay, I received your Oprah request but the correct person is this person, use their name, use their address, use their, their phone number, or they need to forward that to the correct person. Yes, sir. I was going to say, following up on the napkin example, my recollection of uh, the OPA request form uh, from my township is a couple of uh, boxes they want you to check, uh, maybe indicating you're not a convicted felon yeah, or you don't, you don't have uh, some type of criminal Yep. Relationship yes. with you know with they the person that you're you. you know, yes. requesting information on. I have never seen it. Just it, to me, I'm John, a, it's on Monroe. Yeah, I'm a libertarian, so it never ceases to amaze me how convoluted a simple thing can be made yeah. by a, by a government agency. I've seen Oprah request forms that are four and five and six pages long, and going through every definition of every. I mean. Well, that's, that's the GRC form. Yeah, well, that now that one, that's the GRC form with the common law. But my, what I do is I have a word processing program, a template. It says on the top of it, like 50-point type, Oprah request. So they can't mis say 
plausibly that they didn't understand. Now, they do have a, a point on that. Now, when you make an OPA request, it should be fairly straightforward. I mean, I've seen people, they'll write a letter to the clerk that'll be four pages long, and then on page three in paragraph two, there's a reference to the fact that they'd like a document, and then and they miss that. It should be something where they look at it and it says, oh, this is a records request, this is what it is. The next sentence says, it has my name, then I have name, John Payne, address, please, I don't give them my address. I want them to use my email address or my fax. And I'm, I'm entitled to specify the type of response that I want. Under the new law that was just passed, they can't charge you for fax and email records. They can charge you a nickel a page for paper copies. It's not the nickel a page, it's just the whole process now that if I want paper copies, they're going to, Bradley Beecher or Neptune is going to get back to me and say, okay, you owe us 45 cents. Then I have to write them a check for 45 cents, put it in the mail, get it to them, and then they get me the records. If there's no charge, then that whole transaction doesn't exist. So I put name, John Path, address, do not mail me anything. Use fax or email only. Email, fax, and then I have the nature of what I'm looking for. Now, the, 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 the first thing it says, I request the following records under the Open Public Records Act and under the common law right to, of access. So I want to make it clear in my request that I'm not limiting myself just to Oprah, but I also want it in accordance with the common law. Invariably, when I get a denial, they'll deny me under Oprah. They'll say, you're not entitled to this record because Oprah accepts and so-and-so says so. And they will never even address my common law. So I have to write them a letter back saying, you know, you might recall that I asked for it under both Oprah and the common law. You denied me under Oprah. That's fine. I may or may not agree with that. But under the common law right of access, I believe that I have a right to these records. It's superior to yours. And would you let me know what your reason is? What, would you assert your reason? But So that's essentially how you make an Oprah request. And you can fax it to them most times unless they have decided that you can't, that they're not going to accept fax requests. And that's unfortunate I'm in the path versus... East Orange, which is not a case I'm proud of, but we we, we, we got a decision uh, that we lost at the appellate division level that says that that custodians, even though Oprah says that you can mail it, hand deliver it, or electronically transmit your request to the custodian of records, they're permitting record custodians to decide what that means. So a record like the city of East Orange says, we don't accept faxed requests. Now how silly this gets is I send them a faxed request. I fax them a request, and they send me a fax back saying, we don't accept fax requests. Well, why? I mean, you, you obviously got the request. I'm going to mail it to you. I mean, it's, it's stupid. But, so now, when you fax a request to them, you have to, you have to figure out whether or not, they might, it, it, theoretically, they don't even have to tell you that they don't accept fax requests if they don't. If they adopt the internal office policies that we don't accept fax, fax requests, they don't have to put it on the website. They don't have to notify anybody that they don't accept it. If you fax them a request, they just don't respond. So then you don't know if the reason why they're not responding is because they're violating OPRA or because they're not accepting fax requests. So it gets a little dicey, and that's the reason why that, that rule is a little frustrating. Mostly, though, I don't have a problem most municipalities do accept fax requests or email requests even better. And, and, and most of them, if they don't accept a particular transmission method, I mean, they'll come back to you and say, we, we don't. Or there's something on their website that says, we don't accept fax requests. But generally, you're always in good shape if you mail it. Generally, you're OK if you email it or, 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 or fax it. I just want to talk a little bit about what's, what is the wrong way to make a request. Oh, wrong way. There's lots of wrong ways to make a request. I just wanted to ask something, because um, we're always Oprah in our township. Um, we, when we request the minutes for the township meetings, and we get the disc, is there um, a wall that limits what they can charge you, like the paper, when you over it's five cents a copy, but oh, yeah. is there a limit on the disc what they can charge you? Direct cost. What do you get charged for the disc? What is it, five bucks a disc? Too much. Oh, yeah? Too what much. Here's, here's what I'm doing right now, as we speak, I'm making a... I'm doing a project, Camden County is the lucky county, I'm, I'm making an open request to every municipality in Camden County asking how much, I, I, <laughs> I, want a co I, I want an audio recording of your most recent planning board town council meeting. Then I say, I, I really don't want the disc as much as I just want to know how much you think you can charge me for because I'm, I'm doing a survey, I want to know how much it's going to be. I have some towns will say, six cents. 
Some towns say, well, we don't record any of our meetings. So you, you don't get them. I've had other towns say $5. I've had some towns say $25. Then I rent, I, and, but, but in my over request, I tell them that if you think that you're going to charge us like $5, I want to let you know that over requires you to charge actual cost, direct cost of that medium, of that CD, how much that is. So if you are thinking of telling me that you're going to charge me $5 or $10, you might want to talk to your township attorney and reconsider that. If you send me that and say that you're going to charge me $5, I can pretty much guarantee you I'm going to sue you. So you ought to really think this through. The object of it really wasn't to get the desk. The object is so, but the, the short answer to your question is it should cost them whatever it, it should cost you whatever it cost them for that CD. So, if they buy a box of them for a, buy a spindle of a hundred of them for eight bucks, it should cost you, you know whatever that is eight cents a piece. That's what it should that's what it should cost. So I would definitely not let them get away with five dollars. Now, is there a, a law that I can state? It's New Jersey, dot, dot, dot. That yes, there's, you can say, that? which is the case? Is it Mount North Island? Or, uh, uh, there's uh, a bunch of them. There's, there's Coulter versus Bridgewater, it's GRC case number 2008 220. That's right. Uh, there's, um, there's O'Shea versus Vernon, which is 2007-237. You could say that, but you, all you really have to say is that I, I talked to some people, and they told me that you're only allowed to charge me actual cost, and that's never five dollars unless you've got a, you actually are paying five dollars a piece for these these discs. So here's the deal: I'm going to make this request again, and I want you to really carefully consider what you're going to charge me, me knowing this. And understand that if I do sue, if I go to the either government records council, you're going to if you lose, you're going to end up paying attorney's fees as well. So consider. You know, I always try, I don't really look for lawsuits. I look for compliance. I look for records. I want these people to do the right thing. So the purpose of the Camden exercise is to get everybody, get all these guys on 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 page where they're they're all charging the actual cost of their CDs and they're not ripping people off because that's dissuading people from getting public records. Five dollars is a lot of money to pay. Or a CD, especially if you do it every meeting. Right, every, every so, month or so. So, the, so the thing is, is you should, and under the GRC, if you've done this five times, I think you're entitled to a refund of the five dollars. Yeah. So I would say, yeah. I mean, I think you have. Did you say Hainesport? Hainesport, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of Hainesport. Yeah. I'm um, okay, we're all, I just emailed you late. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had another. No, I think that you. I don't think you, you. You can't let them get away with that because if you know, you have to correct them. Because if you, and, and I had one clerk in Camden, I'll come mention the town, she said, okay, for you, we're going to make it 50 cents. I said, not acceptable. I'm not doing this. I want a statement from you in writing that this isn't just for me. This is for anybody who wants one of these things. They're going to get charged 50 cents. I don't, I'm not looking to get your disc for 50 cents. I'm looking to get it where the barriers to access are low. So anybody who wants the record can get it. And that's the important part. That's what open government is. So I, uh, so it's a problem. I would, I, would, I would definitely not let that go. Don't believe me. The word will be out tonight like a don't. <laughs> um, John, um, you know, we've had this ongoing problem in Esbury Park where um, the Open Public Meetings Act isn't really respected. We emailed a lot of that. Um, but, of course, when they do have these uh, meetings with the redevelopment to discuss how they might change the redevelopment agreement and the redevelopment plan to the forefront, eventually those, those minutes should become public, I would think. And uh, I'm just wondering how we can how we can do this. I mean, now we've gone from, without seeing the minute, we've gone from one developer <coughs> who had held the rights to getting his getting into trouble with uh, owing money, and now the person who he owed is now uh, the one running the show as far as the, uh, the redevelopment rights go. And we still haven't even seen what this guy looks like. You know, you're, you're asking for meeting minutes, you're not getting Well, I'm, I'm wondering, at, at one, what, how do we go about this? I mean, at what point do you say, okay, I want the, the minutes from, I mean, it's, it's just considered uh, contract negotiations. It's, it's like this thing that goes on forever. Well, this is now we're getting into the Open Book Meetings Act. The Open Public okay. Meetings Act is that's fine. We, we should talk about the Open Book. We haven't talked about the Open Public Meetings Act yet, but there's a 
there's a law out there called the Uphold Feedings Act that says that, uh, as the Open Public Records Act says, it's important to have access to records. The Open Public Meetings Act says it's important for citizens to be able to have access to meetings. So they have to, the government has to let you know when the meetings are going to be. They have to say, well, you can show up. And in the case of the municipality and the school board, you have a right to some, some period of time within there where you can stand up and say whatever you want to them in public. And, and part of it is they have to keep minutes of those meetings. And there's, there's certain times in all, uh, we used to offset the utility bills for this firehouse to relieve the burden on the taxpayer. So if you're thinking of having an event, please consider us. I would appreciate it. Um, and welcome. My name is Robert Napoli. I spent 20 years in, uh, in state and local government, 20 years in private business. Uh, I've seen the ins and outs of, of government. Uh, I've worked for the Department of Community Affairs for many, many years. Uh, and I've sat on many boards and commissions. I served as a councilman and currently um, the vice president of this fire company. Uh, I've witnessed, you know, the good and bad in government. And, um, I've, worked, I've, I've witnessed the miracles of what good government can do for the people, and I've witnessed all right, the humility and the shame of what a bad government can do. Uh, uh, likewise, I believe that newspapers try in their best interest to represent the truth in reporting. Um, however, sometimes if you, well, Oprah is a very good tool. Uh, if you want more information, you Oprah that document. Now. I was misquoted in the paper, unfortunately, because uh, Thomas Jefferson once said that advertisements can contain only the truth and uh, to be relied on only in the newspaper. Uh, but James Madison uh, wrote, basically, knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and those who need to be their own governors should arm themselves with all the power that knowledge could give. Um, Henry Clay, Henry Clay uh, I'm sorry, Henry Clay, uh, one of the five greatest senators, um, who was one of the founding fathers also of this country, he said government is a trust, and the officers of that government are trustees, and both the trust and the trustees were created for the benefit of the people. Um, the founding fathers certainly must have had some infinite wisdom, because in 2002, January 8th of 2002, uh, the legislature uh, became law under uh, Open Public Records Act. And uh, since then, there's been many changes. There's been uh, case law on the subject. There's been a lot of GRC uh, uh, changes and uh, recommendations. And I think tonight, that's what we're here to explain to all of you, uh, right, what those differences are and what those changes are. Now, without further ado, let me please uh, introduce the, uh, the panel tonight. John Path, when I met John Path, I, I first had some communication with him. I actually thought he was a law professor. Um, the man is a brilliant man. He writes impeccably. Um, and when I personally met him, I found out he was just a common citizen like you and I, a uh, firefighter, uh, great guy. But Mr. Pear, uh is, uh, is, is an interesting individual. He's done more for this state, uh, for openness, than I know of any other individual that I've ever met in both state and public government. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Path has made some real great strides. Uh, personally, he's made he's uh, he's done it at his own personal cost in a lot of cases. Uh, John uh, has been labeled in certain areas as the uh, sunshine troublemaker, but uh, I kind of like that. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's uh, been. Uh, in, in court many, many times. Uh, and one of them right here in Monmouth County, which was an interesting case with uh, settlement agreements with particularly uh, <coughs> counties that make personnel se settlement agreements on uh, uh, outside of the public view. And I think that uh, you were represented by Mr. Horace and you had won that particular case. Uh, however, Mr. Path has been so active and uh, so successful for so long, it's, far, it's very hard to find anybody in this state that can equal what Mr. Path has done. Uh, so it's with great pride that I introduce you to John Path. Thank you. Michael Perone also is an advocate for open, open government, and uh, he specializes in collecting information, uh, obtaining them for the websites, 
uh, and uh, getting this information from public agencies to disseminate to the public. Um, he provides these databases uh, for the public's use, and uh, with that, I think, Michael, uh, it would be a lot difficult to find information if it weren't for his talent. Uh, Michael? Uh, and how do I describe Walter? Walter, um, I met Walter uh, uh, through, uh, through litigation. Um, I hired Walter as my own attorney and represent me in certain matters with several municipalities. Um, he's the acting director of New Jersey Fog. Uh, he successfully represented me and, and other litigants in Monmouth County and other counties in the state. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, there's probably no better legal authority in this state that, uh, that is recognized other than Walter Lords. His offices are in Oxford, New Jersey. And uh, I'd like to introduce you and turn over the microphone now to Walter Lewis. Mayor, Bob, thank you very much for those, for those gracious words. Um, the, uh, the format here tonight is, is very simple. Uh, John and Mike and I will talk about the Open Public Records Act. But importantly, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt us at any time. We feel that the evening and the conversation goes much smoother if we can incorporate your questions and your concerns in what we say. So if as we're talking, if thoughts pop into your head or whatever you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, we'll stop what we're saying, and we'll talk about it because we much would we much rather have a conversation with you rather than have us um, drone, you know, drone on and on. Uh, and with that I'll give it over, I mean, I'll, I'll moderate a little bit, but I'll give it over to John, and John will talk a little bit about the Old Public Records Act. Okay. Yeah. You know, one of two ways that you can get records in New Jersey is through the Open Public Records Act. The other way is through the common law right of access. Prior to the Open Public Records Act, which was passed the Oprah in 2002, we had a thing called the Right to Know Law. The Right to Know Law was deficient in several respects. Two notable deficiencies were that there, were, there was no time limit within which the government had to get back to you after you made a request. So the governments predictably would just never get back to you in response to the request. And, you would, and that, that brings us to the second deficiency, which is that if you were to sue a government agency because of their failure to respond or their denial of a request, you were not able to get attorney's fees in excess of $500. So what would happen is the requester would be faced with this dilemma where they would go out and get an attorney to cost them maybe $3,000 or $4,000 in order to get a record and only be able to recover legally only up to $500 if they, if they were successful in their lawsuit. Clearly it was unsatisfactory. And, uh, and, the, and the record custodians around the state took advantage of that. They knew the position of the citizen requester, and they knew it wasn't worth hundreds of dollars to most, to most citizens to actually just prevail and get a record. So uh, it, was a, it was a woefully inadequate law. The inadequacies, I believe, out of that came Oprah. And two of the more important provisions, a lot of details of Oprah and, and, and what kind of records, and there's a lot of differences. But, the one thing that you can get, the one thing is that they have a seven business day period of time within which they must respond. So if you put a request into a, to a municipality or a school board or any other agency or a state agency, they have to, within seven business days, either grant your request, deny your request, or they have to ask for an extension of time or clarification of the request. If they fail to get back to you within seven business days, it is considered a deemed denial. It is the same as them denying the request. And then you can take them to court, or you can take them to the Government Records Council. Well, the second thing is that there is no limit on the amount of attorney's fees you can recover. Attorney's fees for a successful over litigant are mandatory. The court has to award you the attorney's fees if, you, if your records request was instrumental in bringing about the record, whether you do it through a settlement or whether you get a judgment of the court. So it's a very powerful tool because you can ask for a record and you're, you're forcing the government to give you some sort of a response within seven business days, and if they fail to do that at all, you can, you can hire an attorney. Now, the way the attorney will work on this, and, and, and typically water and there's other attorneys that do the same thing, 
is they take the case on contingency. The idea being that they get paid if and only if the government agency pays them. So as the client, you're generally not on the hook for any out-of-pocket expenses as far as attorney's fees. Most attorneys will probably want you to pay the $200 filing fee for the, for the uh, or the $230 filing fee, I should say, for the order to show cause in Superior Court. But you would get that back if you prevail. So you would get costs and attorney's fees. So it gives the citizen requester a very powerful tool. Now the other part of it, and what Oprah, like the right to know law did, is it specifically reserved the common law right to, to access records. New Jersey's a common law state, meaning that we recognize, unless it was it'd been abrogated by a statute or a court decision, the courts in this state will recognize pre-1776 colonial law and the law from Great Britain as being the common law. And under the common law, you have a separate distinct right in order to get records. So the common law is not like Oprah. Oprah, Oprah is like an on-off switch. If you ask for a record, they have to give it to you, regardless of your reasons for wanting it, unless there's a specific exemption that says that they don't have to give it to you. If the exemption applies, you don't get the record under Oprah. Under the common law, even if you're not entitled to the record under Oprah, under the common law, you have a right to the record to the extent that your interest in needing it as a, as a private interest or a public interest in needing the record is greater than the government's need to retain the record confidentiality. So, like in, uh, like for instance, Oprah says that the common law will apply even to criminal investigatory records which are exempt under Oprah. So if you ask for a criminal investigatory record such as a, a police report or, 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 or something that, uh, a record kept by a police agency, even if they deny it under Oprah, you still have a separate right. If you can show that your interest in that record is greater than their interest in keeping it confidential, you can prevail under the common law. Now recently, in the case of Mason versus Hoboken, the court made a pretty astonishing statement. The Supreme Court of New Jersey said that you, you get, even if you win under the common law right of access and not under Oprah, you're still entitled to recover your attorney's fees. And that's huge because a lot of the records are exempt under Oprah, and some of the more interesting cases are those where the citizen is trying to say, I have a better right or a more, a more, a higher or a better right in the record than you have to keep it confidential. And I just had a case like that in Union County where we're pursuing attorney's fees. The case was a, um, a videotape of a police officer in uniform um, trespassing, using his key to go in and borrow and, and, and go around and, and into, the, into the borough and poke around and look and filing cabinets and drawers when he wasn't supposed to be there. And I wanted to get a copy of the video so I could put it on YouTube. Garvin, of course, said no. And we fought it, and we won. And it was considered a criminal investigatory record and thus exempt under Oprah. But it was considered a common law record because the borough couldn't come up with a reason why they needed to keep it confidential in, in light of the public's interest in seeing what this officer actually did. So we currently have a motion pending for Judge Brock or, or seeking attorney's fees. And I'd like to get that case, if we win that case, it'll show an actual example where you can win under the common law and actually get fees. But as far as Oprah goes, uh, essentially every record, any record that is required to be made, or any record that's not really, that was the old right to know law standard required to be made, but any record that is on file on, in any government office is a government record, except for some exceptions. Those exceptions would be things like criminal investigatory records, certain personnel records, uh, and there's a whole list of them, and there's a booklet up here that people can take that, that, that has the, the entire text, and it, it'll, it'll explain what, what, over, what the exceptions are. But essentially, if you're interested in any, in any issue, that's what you want to do. You want to file an OPRA request to the agency and ask them for a copy of the record that would express or would, would reveal the documents that you'll reveal the information that you're looking for. What's, what's the correct way to file an OPRA request? Uh, the correct way to file an open request. First off, you don't have to use their government form. That's a, that was a big uh, people really underestimate the importance of that decision. Uh, there was this was this the decision was Tina Renna versus County of Union, and uh, they it was the the opinion of the Government Records Council, which is the state agency <coughs> that, that enforces OPRA, that you had to use each agency's specific form in order to make a request. I live in Somerset, New Jersey. Suppose, and routinely, I would make requests in, you know, in, in this area. 
So let's say I wanted to go to a, a town, not like Bradley Beach, but a town, you know, with a, a nice town like Bradley Beach, where they're very open. But another town, I won't mention any names. And, 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 <laughs> and you, you asked for, I said, I want, to make, I want to make a record. They said, well, you have to make the record on our form. Well, how do I get a copy of your form? It's not on your website for download. Well, you have to request from us the form. Well, how do I do that? Well, give me your address or send me, I've had this, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope in the mail and we will then return the form to you that you can then complete in order to have, that is, 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 is it's, it's, a, it's ridiculous to have to, to have to request the request form from, from a municipality. But this is, but sometimes this is the way some of these people play. I mean, I'm, I'm going to throw it out and say it, a lot of the towns, I mean, I mean, there are several towns that they're not really playing in good faith. I mean, this isn't a situation where they're making mistakes and they don't understand Oprah and they don't understand. They, have a, they don't have a commitment toward the open government philosophy. They, they, and I think part of the reason is, is, dare I say that there is corruption in New Jersey, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the towns who are, are and the, the towns that are populated with officials who are corrupt are gener generally not interested in having their corruption exposed. And what they, yes sir? Uh, I'm availing his <laughs> invitation to interrupt, sorry. Um, okay. I live in Asbury Park 14 years and you want to pick a corrupt town. I live there, Asbury Park is corrupt. Now I requested some information. Um, my question is, what if they give you the wrong information that's not what you requested, but it looks similar. I request some information on some money specifically given to the city by Bruce Springsteen to use for a community center. So they came back in two weeks, by the way, but anyway, they came back with this stuff about 25000 that he'd given for a park and had some things about some uh, stuffy supplies that they bought with it and this and that, but it wasn't even the actual request I had made. But how do I deal with that? Because I gave them, uh, I didn't know the exact date they gave it, but I gave them the year, approximately a no. year. And they knew what I was talking about, but they just pulled one over on me and gave me the wrong information. No, that happens a lot with people where they play hide the ball. Exactly. Um, they, 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 like, I, I'm, I'm talking to these people, and, and they know that what I'm looking for is the, the resolution 3807. And I'll say, well, there was a resolution that started with 38. I had a seven in some place, and I, I was trying to, and it had to do with this, and they'll just look at me, and they'll go, hmm. They just, they don't act as if they don't know what I want. But what you do, and what I do, and it seems to work, well, first off, under Mason versus Hoboken, the Supreme Court told that re records requesters and the custodians are supposed to cooperate with each other. It's not supposed to be a game of hide the ball. It's supposed to be, well, try to get the guy what he wants. Try to, you know, work with him. So what I do is I will make a record request and they read like a novel. Mm -hmm. I, have, I start off with background. You know, I heard, I understand that sometime back in 2007 or 2008 or thereabouts, uh, Bruce Springsteen gave a certain amount of money uh, to the city to be used for that. And I, I, I would, you know, and then he would then say that, you know, I'm interested in finding out how this uh, money was spent. I don't know exactly when he gave the money, but it was a large sum of money. I think that you probably would remember it. I need your help, city clerk, in, that's Mr. K, uh, to, to help me get the information that I want. And, I don't, and, I, and I'm very genuinely, I'm sincere that I, I want them to help me. And when you, when you, sometimes they will be convinced by that, and they actually will help you. They'll help me. Sometimes what they're doing is they're recognizing predicting how horrible it will look in front of the Superior Court judge to see in the record this genuine, sincere request for assistance in locating the public record that they and only they have knowledge of. You know it exists, but you can't cite the, the exact, you know, the, the, the chapter and verse on it. And they recognize that they will look very mean-spirited and very unopen government if, if, if they see how many times that you and, and you have a whole paper trail that you're asking for this record maybe you know and then they're not then they're just very brusquely just refusing you saying well we don't know what you're talking about so unfortunately they probably push come to shove can get away with if you can't specify with any degree of accuracy what record you're looking for they they probably could push they probably could they probably could get away with that but 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 my experience is that if you if you ask them and you sh and you give them as much information as you have and you explain to them that you don't really know exactly what record you're looking for and that you want them to help you, they generally will. 
So I'd give that a shot. Sure, absolutely. I had a similar situation uh, a while back. I was trying to get uh, check register information from the county of Warren. Um, I wanted to uh, put My together. Get that, yeah. Okay. Get a little closer to the microphone. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I had a similar situation uh, while well, back trying to get uh, check register information from the County of Warren. I, I wanted to get a list of all the checks that they wrote, who they wrote the check to, what purchase order the check was written against, the date that the check was written, the check number, uh, any coverage numbers, and of course the amount of uh, the check. And at that time, I didn't know as much about doing this as I do now. But, they, they told me, well, we don't have that information in the format that you want. So we'll have to hire a, um, an engineer to write a program to give the data to you in the format that you want. And, and I, at that time, I paid for that to happen. But now, when I'm in a in similar circumstance, if someone says to me that they don't have the information that I want, uh, in this instance, what I did was, uh, or what I do now, is I'll go and I'll Oprah the manual the operating manual for the software that they're using to keep the data and that, um, the table of contents here. So I start with the table of contents. I look for the reports that are that are in that table of contents and then I can ask specifically for the report that has the information that I'm looking for. Would you repeat that? It's the OPRA manual for what? Not the OPRA manual. The user, the user manual for the software that they're using to keep the records. And I ask for the table of contents, and I look for their reports. And very often, you'll see reports that relate to the information that you're trying to request. So, if you're getting, if you're not, if you have someone who's not terribly helpful, this is a way to get that help despite all their their their, uh, their animus. And uh, and I've found that to be very successful. Let me Just the user manual for whatever computer software package that they're using in order to generate whatever documents. And that's that's another is, is is a lot of times it's really a lot more helpful to have information in electronic format than it is to have in paper format, uh, especially financial. Stuff. Yeah, Don. What do you do um, if there's obvious or blatant errors and omissions in such a check register in the first person's record? Um, how do you respond to that? That's a good my question. <laughs> yeah, I, I just went through that again with the county of Warren. I, back in 2008, I requested all the checks that they write. And uh, they gave me a, a list of checks. They refused to give me the checks that they were writing to their employees. And at the time, I thought it was just because they didn't want me to know what they were paying their employees. I, since then, I, I've come to a different conclusion. Uh, as it turned out, they had two separate bank accounts using the same set of sequence numbers. And by not giving me the, the employee numbers, anything that was missing in the sequence that I had, I would naturally assume it must be in the data that I wasn't given. That was not the case. But what I found after, after getting the, the uh, winning our case of GRC, Walter uh, won that for me, uh, a little over a year later, when I got the other data, I saw all these duplicate check numbers. I'm going, well, this doesn't make sense. You can't have two checks, 2003 and 2000. So yes, they admitted that they had two separate bank accounts. And then I said, well, if this is a separate bank account. Where are all these missing checks? And that, that's when they started admitting to me that they hadn't given me all the checks that I had requested. So we had, this was fresh off of victory, uh, getting the, the, the records. So I went back and I said, look, you know, my goal here is not to beat you up in public and win lawsuits. I just want to get the data that I'm requesting. So I'm going to uh, resubmit my request and ask you to, this time, if you're going to omit a check number, I want to know why it's been omitted. It should be redacted, and I should be given a reason for the redaction. Uh, and, and please give me all of the, the uh, check numbers. And they agreed. So we went back, and they redid the data, and I just recently got the, uh, the data. Now, there's still problems. There's still a few missing checks, and what I'll probably have to do there is make an open request for the missing check numbers. But I'm not specifically what to ask for, and then we'll see where that where that takes us. What, what was the reason for them omitting the numbers or the checks? <laughs> well, uh, the reason I was told that, uh, that some of the checks were not given to me was that they were voided checks. Uh, well, we didn't give you any of the voided checks. And I said, well, there's way too many checks to just be voided checks unless you're just writing checks and every third or fourth one you avoid it. Uh, then they said, well, we didn't want to give you the checks that we write to the poll workers because, you know, it 
it's hard enough to get people to do poll workers without telling us uh, what you're doing. And, I, and my response to them was simply, well, just quote the statute that you're using to not give me the poll worker checks. Yes, sir. But, but they have to report them to ELAP. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And, and well, actually, you know, the, the, what, what started this role... Poll or poll? The electric poll? The, no, no, the poll electric electric people who electric 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 yeah, so that's exactly so that what I was told was that if I wanted to pursue that, they yeah. could provide that information to me, uh, but they would have to go back to the bank to get the, the uh, images. Right. And, and actually, the, uh, the way that, that I first got wind that this week, that there was something wrong was uh, a woman in my, uh, my little tea party group was concerned about the local, uh, nursing home. that it, She felt that it had been going downhill for a couple of years. And, her aunt was in the nursing home. So she asked me to run a check register on the nursing home, which I did. And the nursing home data was duplicative of the data that I had asked. It's a subset of that data because the Warren County government writes the checks for the nursing home. So when I compared the two records, I saw checks in the one set of check data that didn't appear in the other set. Uh, and I also noticed that, for example, there were vendors missing in the checking register data that I got from the nursing home that I got from the county in, the, uh, in 2008. So the rent registry request I made in 2010, in April 2010, I, I, I was finding checks that weren't there. And, and if you, for anyone who's interested in doing this, one of the very first things that you should look at if you do go get a check register database is put, sort the checks by check number order and look for missing checks. Very important. Can you get the bank statements? Yes, they are. The monthly statements? There's, there's no exemption for it. Yeah. Yes. Right. Then, if you don't have to really use the form, <coughs> can you simply write a letter to them? How do you... Um... Well, the, 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 the example I use is that you can use a paper napkin. You can use anything. It has, it has to be in writing. I mean, well, it's, it's an extreme example, but the extreme example proves the point, which is that the only requirement is that the OPA request be in writing, and then a reference Oprah. It's a good idea to, to mention Oprah. I mean, I could probably work around that if it went to court, but it should, it should say this request is being made pursuant to the Old Public Records Act, and then ask, and, and then list what you want. Uh, and that's, and that's the, you know, the flip side of that coin is, you know, we talked a little bit about how do you make a request. The request has to be in writing, and it doesn't have to be on a form. Then the question is, well, who do you give it to? You know, theoretically, in the state of New Jersey, if you give your OPA request to a public employee, that, impu that public employee has a responsibility under OPA to do one of two things. They have to either give the OPA request to the records custodian, or they have to direct you to the records custodian. So theoretically, if, and this isn't my example, this is the example of the, the director of the Government Records Council. Theoretically, if you hand in an OPA request, to a, to a guy taking tolls, collecting tolls on the turnpike or the parkway, they would have to either direct you to the correct records custodian, or they'd have to forward that OPA request to, to the correct person. Now again, it's an extreme example, but that's what the law says. So if you're writing a letter to an agency and you say, you know, dear sir, uh, dear uh, records custodian, um, under Oprah, I request the following records, and you list them X, Y, and Z. Let's say that letter doesn't get to the right person. That right person still has the responsibility. I see your hand. That right person, that person still has the responsibility to either get back to you and say, "Okay, I received your Oprah request, but the correct person is this person. Here's their name, here's their address, here's their, here's their phone number," or they need to forward that to the correct person. Yes, sir. I was going to say, following up on the napkin example. My recollection of uh, the OPA request form uh, from my township, there's a couple of uh, boxes they want you to check, uh, maybe indicating you're not a convicted felon yeah, yeah, or you don't, yeah. you don't have uh, some type of criminal yeah. relationship yeah. with, yeah. You know, with the person that you're you. yeah. 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 requesting information on. I have never seen it. Just it, to me, I'll John, it's on Monroe. 
Yeah, I'm a libertarian, so it never ceases to amaze me how convoluted a simple thing can be made yeah. by, a, by a government agency. I've seen OPA request forms that are four and five and six pages long, and going through every definition of every, I mean, well, that's, all that's the GRC form. Yeah, well, that now that one, that's the GRC form with the common law. But my, what I do is I have a word processing program, a template. It says on the top of it, like 50 point type, OPA request. So they can't mis say plausibly that they didn't understand. Now, they do have a, a point on that. Now, when you make an OPA request, it should be fairly straightforward. I mean, I've seen people, they'll write a letter to the clerk that'll be four pages long, and then on page three in paragraph two, there's a reference to the fact that they'd like a document, and then and they miss that. It should be something where they look at it, and it says, oh, this is a records request. This is what it is. The next sentence says, it has my name, then I have name, John Pat, address, Please, I don't give them my address. I want them to use my email address or my fax. And I'm, I'm entitled to specify the type of response that I want. Under the new law that was just passed, they can't charge you for fax and email and records. They can charge you a nickel a page for paper copies. It's not the nickel a page, it's just the whole process now that if I want paper copies, they're going to, Bradley Beach or, or Neptune is going to get back to me and say, okay, you owe us 45 cents, then I have to write them a check for 45 cents, put it in the mail, get it to them, and then they get me the records. If there's no charge, then that whole transaction doesn't exist. So I put name, John Path, address, do not mail me anything. Use fax or email only. Email, fax, and then I have the nature of what I'm looking for. Now, the, now the, that first thing it says, I request the following records under the Open Public Records Act and under the common law right to, of access. So I want to make it clear in my request that I'm not limiting myself just to OPA, but I also want it in accordance with the common law. Invariably, when I get a denial, they'll deny me under OPA. They'll say, you're not entitled to this record because OPA accepts and so-and-so says so. And they will never even address my common law. So I have to write them a letter back saying, you know, you might recall that I asked for it under both OPA and the common law. You denied me under OPA. That's fine. I may or may not agree with that. But under the common law right of access, I believe that I have a right to these records. It's superior to yours. And would you let me know what your reason is? What, would you assert your reason? But So that's essentially how you make an OPA request. And you can fax it to them most times unless they have decided that you can't, that they're not going to accept fax requests. And that's unfortunate in mean, the path versus... East Orange, which is not a case I'm proud of, but we we, we, we got a decision uh, that we lost at the appellate division level that says that that custodians, even though Oprah says that you can mail it, hand deliver it, or electronically transmit your request to the custodian of records, they're permitting record custodians to decide what that means. So a record like the city of East Orange says, we don't accept fax requests. Now how silly this gets is I send them a fax to request. I faxed them a request, and they send me a fax back saying, we don't accept faxed requests. Well, why? I mean, you, you obviously got the request. What am I supposed to do, mail it to you? I mean, it's, it's stupid. But, so now, when you fax the request to them, you have to, you have to figure out whether or not, they might, it, it, theoretically, they don't even have to tell you that they don't accept fax requests if they don't. If they adopt the internal office policies that we don't accept fax, fax requests, they don't have to put it on the website. They don't have to notify anybody that they don't accept it. If you fax them a request, they just don't respond. So then you don't know if the reason why they're not responding is because they're violating OPRA or because they're not accepting fax requests. So it gets a little dicey, and that's the reason why that, that rule is a little frustrating. Mostly, though, I don't have a problem most municipalities do accept fax requests or email requests, even better. And 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 most of them, if they don't accept a particular transmission method, I mean, they'll come back to you and say we, we don't. Or there's something on their website that says we don't accept fax requests. But generally, you're always in good shape if you mail it. Generally, you're okay if you email it or or or, or fax it. Should probably talk a little bit about what's, what is the wrong way to make a request? Oh, wrong way. There's lots of wrong ways to make it. Yes. I just wanted to ask something, because um, we're always operating in our township. Um, we, when we request the minutes for the township meetings, and we get the disc, is there um, a wall that limits what they can charge you, like the paper, when you over it's five cents a copy, but oh, yeah. is there a limit on the disc, what they can charge you? Direct cost. What do you get charged for the disc? Is it five bucks a disc? Too five much. Bucks. 
Too much. Here's, here's what I'm doing right now. As we speak, I'm making a, I'm doing a project. Camden County is the lucky county. I'm, I'm making an open request to every municipality in Camden County asking how much I, I, I want a cop, I, I want an audio recording of your most recent planning board town council meeting. Then I say, I, I really don't want the disc as much as I just want to know how much you think you can charge me for because I'm, I'm doing a survey. I want to know how much it's going to be. I have some towns will say, six cents. Some towns say, well, we don't record any of our meetings. So you, you don't get them. I've had other towns say $5. I've had some towns say $25. Then I rent, I, and, but in my over request, I tell them that if you think that you're going to charge us like $5, I want to let you know that over requires you to charge actual cost, direct cost of that medium, of that CD, how much that is. So if you are thinking of telling me that you're going to charge me $5 or $10, you might want to talk to your township attorney and reconsider that. If you send me that and say that you're going to charge me $5, I can pretty much guarantee you I'm going to sue you. So you will really think this through. The object of it really wasn't yet the disc. The object is so, but the, end, the short answer to your question is it should cost them whatever it, which it cost you whatever it cost them for that CD. So, if they buy a box of them for a bag, a spindle of a hundred of them for eight bucks, it should cost you you know whatever that is eight cents a piece. That's what it should. That's what it should cost. So I would definitely not let them get away with five dollars. Now, is there a, a rule that I can state? It's New Jersey, dot, dot, dot. That yes, there's, you can say, that? which is the case? Is it the Mount North County? Or, uh, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of them. There's, there's Coulter versus Bridgewater, it's a GRC case number 2008 220. Go slow. There's um, there's O'Shea versus Vernon, which is 2007 237. You could say that, but you, all you really have to say is that I, I talked to some people and they told me that you're only allowed to charge me actual cost, and that's never $5 unless you've got a, you actually are paying $5 a piece for these, these discs. So here's the deal I want to make this request again, and I want you to really carefully consider what you're going to charge me, me knowing this. And understand that if I do sue, if I go to the either government records council, you're going to if you lose, you're going to end up paying attorney's fees as well. So consider. You know, I always try, I don't really look for lawsuits. I look for compliance. I look for records. I want these people to do the right thing. So the purpose of the Camden exercise is to get everybody, get all these guys on 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 page where they're they're all charging the actual cost of their CDs and they're not ripping people off because that's dissuading people from getting public records. Five dollars is a lot of money to pay. For a CD, especially if you do it every meeting. Right. Every, every so, month stuff. so the so the thing is, is you should. And under the GRC, if you've done this five times, I think you're entitled to a refund of the five dollars. Yeah. So I would say, yeah. I mean, I think you have. Did you say Hainsport? Hainsport. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of Hainsport. Yeah. I'm Paul. Uh, I just emailed you later. Yeah. Because <laughs> we had another. No, I think that you. Here. I don't think you, you. You can't let them get away with that because if you know, you have to correct them. <laughs> Because if you, and, and I had one clerk in Camden, I'll come mention the town. She said, okay, for you, we're going to make it 50 cents. I said, not acceptable. I'm not doing this. I want a statement from you in writing that this isn't just for me. This is for anybody that wants one of these things. They're going to get charged 50 cents. I don't, I'm not looking to get your disc for 50 cents. I'm looking to get it where the barriers to access are low. So anybody who wants the record can get it. And that's the important part. That's what open government is. So I, uh, so it's a problem. I would, I would, I would definitely not let that go. Oh, believe me. The word will be out tonight like a boom. <laughs> um, John, um, you know, we've had this ongoing problem in Esperance Park where um, the Open Public Meetings Act isn't really respected. I think we emailed a lot of that. Um, but, of course, when they do have these uh, meetings with the redeveloper to discuss how they might change the redevelopment Eventually, those, those minutes should become public, I would think. And uh, I'm just wondering how we can how we can do this. I mean, now we've gone from without seeing the minutes, we've gone from one developer <coughs> who had held the rights to getting his his getting into trouble with uh, owing money, and now the person who he owed is now. Uh, the one running the show as far as the, uh, the 
development rights go. And we still haven't even seen what this guy looks like. You're, you're asking for meeting minutes, you're not getting them. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, at, at what, what, how do we go about this? I mean, at what point do you say, okay, I want the, the minutes from, I mean, it's, it's just considered uh, contract negotiations. It's, it's like this thing that goes on forever. Well, this is now we're getting into the Open Public Meetings Act. The Open Public okay. Meetings Act is that's fine. We, we should talk about the Open Public. We haven't talked about the Open Public Meetings Act yet, but there's a there's a law out there called the Open Public Meetings Act that says that, uh, as the Open Public Records Act says, it's important to have access to records. The Open Public Meetings Act says it's important for citizens to be able to have access to meetings. So they have to, the government has to let you know when the meetings are going to be. They have to say, well, you can show up. And in the case of the municipality and school board, you have a right to some, some period of time within there where you can stand up and say whatever you want to them in public. And, and part of it is they have to keep minutes of those meetings. And there's, there's certain times you can't have, uh, you can't have, a, we're a town council up here, let's say, the three of the township committee. And we're going to talk about how we're going to negotiate with a, with a contract, the guy that's selling us road salt. And we're saying, well, we're going to give him so many dollars a ton, and uh, he's going to want this number of dollars per ton, and we'll go up this high, but we won't go any higher. He can't. If we have that this conversation in, in public, the, the contractors we sit right in the audience, he'll know our strategy. We have to be able to, as a town council, we have to be able to caucus and kind of strategize as to how we're going to deal with this litigant or this this uh, this contractor. So those are reasons for executive sessions and, and, and but that's what's commonly abused in a lot of towns is they, they go into executive session for reasons that they're not entitled to go into them and once they go into them they don't keep reasonably comprehensible minutes of it so you'll have a two-hour meeting boiled down to three lines on a piece of paper and they call this reasonably comprehensible minutes or what they do is they don't give you access to the meeting minutes even when even even six months, eight months, ten months after the, the meeting, they don't they just don't they say well we haven't got around to approving them yet we're not going we're not going to give them to you. The biggest problem with the Open Public Meetings Act is that there is no fee shifting provision, and that's my view is that there is no attorney fee provision where if you were successful in litigating against the town for violating blatantly violating the Open Public Meetings Act, even if you get the judge to say you're right, Maureen, you're right. The town's totally wrong. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry that it costs you five thousand dollars to bring this lawsuit. You're not getting a nickel of it back. The town just they pay their legal expenses. You pay yours. That's the reason why there's so much. It's the same thing with Oprah. Before Oprah, before there was a fee shifting provision, that the, the, the clerks would abuse the requesters with 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 not getting back to them or their towns. I shouldn't really lay that on the clerks. The town fathers would say. You know, don't don't give these people these records because there's nothing they can really do about it because they can't afford to take us to court. Yeah. And and well, since we have a fee shifting provision in Oprah, now that's changed. The towns are saying, well, we got to deal with this because it's, we're going to get sued, we're going to lose, we're going to pay our attorneys fees. It's going to be in the paper. It's going to make us look bad. The, the, they're still operating under the pre-Oprah days and that mode of just let's not do what we're supposed to do because they realize <laughs> that it's difficult. If not, it's very difficult to expect a member of the public to spend thousands of dollars out of their own pocket in order to make sure their town or their school board is keeping their meeting minutes right or, or, or advertising their meetings correctly. So until there's a fee shifting provision in OPMA, the Open Public Meetings Act, where the attorney fees get paid by the, by the losing municipality or the losing government agency, it's going to be dicey. It's going to be hard. But, but can I then go in with Oprah and ask, say that those are records that should be there, the minutes? Well, that's a hybrid case. Well, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, 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 two, there's two ways. There's two ways I deal with that issue. The first way is, yeah, I try to I try to find hybrid Oprah OPMA cases. Uh, so the situation you're talking about, if if minutes are being created, but you're not being allowed access to them, I'll go into court and I'll say, look, Judge, number one, under the Open Public Meetings Act. They're supposed, to have create, they're supposed to have created and approved those minutes within a certain period of time. Now, the rule in this county that, that, that Bob and I got established by Judge Lawson, and any old public meetings that case is going to go to Judge Lawson, the rule in this county is that minutes for any meeting, for any meeting, whether it's public or executive or whatever, have to be prepared and reviewed and, and should be approved by the governing body within 30 days after the meeting. Okay, not six months, not eight months, you know, not that. 30 days. That includes the executive session minutes. Now, does that mean that you have access to the executive session minutes? Not necessarily. 
because that's what John was talking about, but there's, there's exceptions. Now, the issue is how long do those exceptions apply? They apply as long as the need for secrecy exists. So if there's contract negotiations and they're holding meetings discussing the contract negotiations, they have to create the minutes and the minutes have to be approved. Now, when you request them, if the contract negotiations are still ongoing, then the portion of the meeting that dealt with the contract negotiations should be redacted. It doesn't mean that you don't get the minutes. You still get the minutes. The minutes should say when the meeting started, who was there, who was there is critical. Because if, 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 if you know, if they're, as, as Bob knows, you know, if they've got like the other comp, you know, the other side of the, the negotiation, the other side in, in, in the agreement there, that's not allowed. The whole, the whole idea of, of the confidentiality is that they can internally discuss the issues, not have some nego private negotiation. They're not supposed to have a private negotiation. Oh, yeah, we used that in the first part. Yes, which, which, yeah, which, which, which matured into Napoli versus Borough of Interlake. Exactly. You may want to clarify, though, it's, it's because they pulled that, well, we haven't memorialized the minutes yet, so therefore they're not available to the public. Approved, but it's draft well, that, that, that's right, and that's why uh, the, the, the sequence, what I was trying to get at, is, is this, there's supposed to be a sequence. Once there's a meeting, the minutes are supposed to be prepared, and then the minutes are supposed to be prepared and reviewed by the governing body and approved. And then over time, and, you know, and, and there can be a breakdown at any point in that sequence. Maybe they don't draft the minutes. Maybe they draft the minutes, but they don't approve them. Maybe they approve them, but they continue to withhold them from the public. So, so there's a there's a sequence to be followed, and and since there's no fee shifting, it, you know, frequently there isn't an enforcement action when that sequence isn't being followed. Now, from what you described, I don't know what's going wrong. Frankly, I don't know if folks are not drafting the minutes or if they're drafting the minutes but not approving the minutes. But the point is, in an open public meetings action, we would say, look, judge, there's there's a proper sequence. And the sequence is within 30 days, the minutes have to be drafted and reviewed by the governing body. And if they're, if they're sufficient, then they're approved. And then over time, the confidentiality of the, of, of the minutes would, would erode away as litigations are resolved, as contractual negotiations are concluded. You would then get to see what, what was said. So the confidentiality does, does erode. Yes, sir. What about a board that meets only once a month? Like if we met on the third Tuesday of, just say, September, and we approved the meeting, the minutes of the meeting on the third week of October, because the board only meets once a month, how much time right after that would, would be sufficient? We, we, we go over the 30-day mark every month, absolutely. It's hard to say. It, it depends. It depends it's on the unique circumstances. Courts have made it pretty clear that it depends on the circumstances of the particular body, how often they meet, things like that. But also, there's no rule that says that they have to be approved. The approval of the minutes, in my mind, has nothing to do with their public availability. The approval of the minutes, when the council sits there and says, yep, we approve those minutes, that doesn't, that, all that means is that they're approving that what is said in those minutes is actually what happened. There's no reason they can't be released prior to that. And in a case of uh, the municipalities, like the open public meetings, or uh, the, the public meetings, even the clerks' association's documents say, their directives say that you should release the minutes to the public as soon as they're prepared. Just mark them draft. As long as they're marked draft, that way everybody knows, well, they could change once they're approved, because councilman so-and-so might say, I didn't say that. So as long as you are. So the same thing with the executive session minutes. Now, in, in the case of, of, of in Monmouth County, I believe Judge Lawson's rule was the, minute, the meeting minutes have to be released within 30 days or prior to the next meeting. That obviates the ability of the town council. You can never approve the minutes if you have to give them to people in draft form prior to the next meeting. And since you can't approve minutes except at a meeting, there's no way that, that, in other words, your reasoning, the reason for keeping the minutes secret until they're approved is undermined by Judge Lawson's decision. So. Essentially, and it makes sense that the purpose of the meeting minutes is just to just to let people know what's going on. If the minute, as long as the public knows that those minutes are might change, there's still a record of what occurred at that meeting. Now, I want to throw this one caveat before I forget. Caveat: Do not ever go to the Government Records Council because 
there's meeting minutes. Let's say that you have meeting minutes or eight months ago and they're still not available and you make an over request for the meeting minutes they don't give them to you. Do not go to the Government Records Council. The Government Records Council will hold that unapproved meeting minutes are advisory, consultative, and deliberative, and therefore do not have to be released. I've gone to the Government Records Council during their public meeting and said to them, look, can you at least tell people that maybe they have a right under the OPMA for those meeting minutes, even if you don't have it under Oprah? No, but they'll just tell you, you lose. And they'll cite this case, um, Lower Owl, Lakes Creek Township. So if you do have a meeting minute, an unapproved meeting minute issue, and then you want to litigate it, litigate it through the Superior Court, because they have the jurisdiction to, to handle both the OPMA violation and the, and the OPRA violation. What, I try, what I'm trying to do is to build up a body of case law in each county. Now you have that already in Monmouth, so if you live in Monmouth County, the Judge Lawson has already held this, both in Napoli and in, uh, in, in, uh, in Pat versus Keyboard. Okay, he said, this is what you got to do. This is the rule. He says, the rule in Monmouth County is this, 30 days or before your next meeting, whichever, <laughs> is, whichever is first. All you really have to do, is this is what I would do, is go to, let's say that you live in a town that's not Keyport or, or uh, Interlinking, mm. say, I, I, in these two cases, Judge Lawson held this, that this is the rule. It's likely that if I were to hire a lawyer and sue you, and since you're in Monmouth County and Judge Lawson's still the assignment judge here, he's going to find that you are subject to the same rule. So why don't we save ourselves all the trouble of this lawsuit, and would you just pass a resolution, would you just start, would you just agree that you have to have these draft minutes available to the public within 30 days? Now the case law, whether it's 30 days, whether it's two weeks, whatever it is, the case law does clearly say that the time period within which they have to produce those minutes has to be known and predictable. The public has to know. So this way, when the time period, whatever it is, is established, that the public is able to say, okay, this is when these meeting minutes are due. I can go tomorrow and get them because that's the deadline. So it's not an unfair question for you to go up to your town council or your school board and say, look, I'm reading in this case here. I'd like to know, would you tell me as a general rule when your meeting minutes, your executive and your public meeting minutes, your redacted executive session meeting minutes in draft form, and your public meeting minutes in draft form, when I can get those prior to the next meeting. What is the date by which they will be prepared? What is your general policy? Because I want to read those minutes prior to your next meeting so that I can come in here and remark and make questions and, and everything else and cogent comments on whatever it is that is in those minutes. And I don't know that, and that deprives me from doing that. It can make me wait until after the meeting before I'm able to do that. So what, when is it? And they have to tell you. They don't have to tell you, but they'd be wrong. And, and, if, and if your governing body is meeting like quarterly or you know not every 30 days, I mean there's uh, no, no judge is going to say okay it's been 30 days. It's 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 usually you know the, the sooner of 30 days or your next regularly scheduled meeting. So as long as you're having regularly scheduled meetings, that's what sets the expectation. And John touched on another point which is very important, which is that in New Jersey, you know for over cases, you've got you can you can take your case to the Government Records Council or to the Superior Court. So what's happening is you have these two different bodies that at the same time are, are developing in, sometimes inconsistent legal rules. So there's some cases that I, I would lose in the GRC that I win in court, and there's other cases that I win in the GRC that I would lose in court. So whenever you've got an OPRA issue and you want it enforced, it's always very important to talk to someone, me, John, whatever, talk to someone Who's, who's played in both you know, arenas. Because there's, like, I'll give you an example. I took a case to court, Superior Court in Union County, that I lose in the GRC. I'm dead in the GRC. Because the GRC has said, well look, when you request emails, you have to do these three things. You have to identify the sender or the recipient, you have to identify a date range, and you have to identify a subject matter. And you know, the first two parts of that test I'm fine with. The third part of the test is crazy. Because, you know, how am I, if I'm asking for emails, how am I supposed to know what the subject matter is if I don't know what the emails are? So we had a client who said, I want all the emails to or from this email address for these two days. And she didn't include a subject. And you know, we go to court and Union County is citing the GRC cases saying, you know, if you don't, if you don't identify a subject, you lose. 
And the court ignored that. This court's allowed to ignore that. The court doesn't have to give any deference to the GRC cases. And we go to court, and the court didn't yell at the Union County Council, but was very short with them and said, look, they gave you an email address. They gave you a mailbox. They said all, me, all emails to or from on these particular dates. So why can't you give them the emails? And, and, and we got an order telling them to get the emails. So again, that's a case I'm dead in the GRC. But I win in Superior Court. So you always have to watch for that. Just like what John says, in Superior Court, you can get the draft minutes, but you're dead in the GRC. So you never, you never want to be in a situation where you lose a case simply because you chose the wrong form. And also with the Superior Court, under the All Public Meetings Act, they can issue injunctions. And that's an important thing. Which, which yeah. is critical because you, you can turn, the All Public Meetings Act is no fee shifting. But if you can go to court and you can get an order from a judge saying, look, you know, Mr. Clark or Mr. Burrow, I'm going to either enjoin you from violating the law, or even just get a court order, where the court order says, don't violate the law in the future. Because if that town violates the law in the future, then instead of bringing a whole new action under the Open Public Records Act, you can bring a motion to enforce litigants' rights, which, which has a fee-shifting provision. So you can, you can turn a non-fee-shifting case into a fee-shifting case by when, when you brought the first lawsuit, get an injunction, get an order. And a trick that I played, and I, I did this successfully against, against, the, um, against the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. We go to court, and the New Jersey the Attorney General is saying, look, judge, we made mistakes, but we fixed them. We know we got it wrong, but we're, we're doing okay now. We, we fixed them. And I get up and I say, well, judge, if they admit that they made mistakes and they admit that they fixed them, then they should have no opposition to an order from you telling them not to do it in the future. The judge was like, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> so I got the order. And I, and I, I, just, I just turned it from, from a non-fee shifting case to a potential fee shifting case, because I can style it as a motion to enforce litigants' rights. Um, well, why don't we go with <clears throat> Given that uh, OPMA lacks the provision for recovery at this time, uh, John, could you elucidate a bit on the idea, if it's a blatant case of, of sunshine violation, of informing or providing the information to a prosecutor, a county prosecutor. And what's the likelihood of success in that scenario? Uh, it depends on the prosecutor. Um, I found that there was really only one prosecutor uh, in Union County, believe it or not, Union County is actually really interested in enforcing the Open Public Meetings Act. Burlington County, I brought them kicking and screaming into it because I, I showed so many violations that finally they sent a letter to all the municipalities saying, look, um, we're, we're supposed to be taking this Open Public Meetings Act seriously here. <laughs> okay, so you guys please, okay, with your first available opportunity, would you guys please start paying the law, essentially. But generally, the Open Public Meetings Act is, is, is two ways to enforce. One is through civil actions, which you can't recover your attorney's fees. Uh, those are actions to usually enjoin the defendant from violating the law again. The second thing is a, uh, a, a well, actually three things. The third one, the second one is to, to void out something the municipality or the school board did because they didn't abide by the Public Meetings Act. So let's say that they hold a secret meeting and they make a decision. You would have that decision voided because the meeting was illegal, that kind of thing. The third way is through imposition of $100 to $500 penalties upon officials who, who knowingly violate the Open Public Meetings Act. I have never in my life ever heard of any instance where any prosecutor in any county has ever assessed such a penalty against any official anywhere. The prosecutors simply do not enforce it. They will sometimes, if they feel like it, and Union County usually feels like it, they'll write a letter to the, the attorney for the town saying, look, we have this complaint here, and unless you want to get fined, you really ought to do it this way. You might get them to do that. But essentially, I write to prosecutors with violations mainly to evidence and to show evidence of the fact that the prosecutors are not responsive to such. In other words, I want to be able to demonstrate that, that the system does not work as advertised. You write a letter to the prosecutor and nothing happens. So I have like Middlesex prosecutor, for instance, is absolutely 
uh, he, he, he they've said that you know this we just don't have the resources uh, to to handle this. This is a, this isn't on our radar screen. We don't find this to be an important use of our time to enforce the Open Public Meetings Act. So so you know don't send us anything. Uh, Monmouth County prosecutors taken a similar stance. They don't really. I've never seen an instance where the Monmouth County prosecutor has ever enforced the Open Public Meetings Act or even taken seriously a complaint that the Open Public Meetings Act has been violated. Now, sometimes the public officials, well, I've had times where I'm able to say, you know, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to report you to the prosecutors. And the public officials naively don't understand that there's no enforcement. So sometimes they're afraid of a fictitious enforcement action, and they'll actually comply out of fear that the prosecutor will do something. But that's really about So essentially, there is no pros prosecutorial enforcement where the attorney general and prosecutors, they don't enforce it. The only way that citizens are going to enforce it is by either paying a lot of money to hire an attorney to bring the case, or to do it themselves, which I can do, and you all can do that too. You might not think you can, but it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's, it's fine on the walls, but there's a book of rules, and it's like making a fairly complex recipe. I mean, you can do it, you just have to follow the instructions. Uh, but most people don't aren't going to enforce the Open Public Meetings Act, because they just aren't going to spend the money to do it. So the problem is, is that there really is no enforcement. And the, the Open Public Meetings Act, suffice it to say that if anybody's going to enforce it, it's people like us. We're going to enforce it. There is no grown-up out there in some office in Trenton or something that's going to say, oh, we're going to, oh, you're, you're violating the Open Public Meetings Act, but we're going, to, we're going to take care of that. It just doesn't happen. There's nobody that does that. So, but yeah. speak to the New Jersey Foundation for Open Government and the... Oh, yeah, well, of course, with us. Well, I mean, you know, and, yeah, well, the, open, the Foundation for Open Government and the Libertarian Party and the ACLU, I mean, I mean, there are groups out there of, of private individuals or, or private groups that will, will, will assist you with, it, it, to the extent that time allows. But, I mean, what I'm saying is there's no government agency that's going to enforce uh, the Open Public Media Center. I have a question for all three of you. Um, first, Michael, uh, on, on data, when you have volumes of data that you, you need, uh, can you specify the medium in which you receive it? Well, yes. Uh, when I make my request, I ask for the, the data in the format that they're keeping. That's what the law provides for. So if they're keeping it in electronic format, I can ask for it in electronic format. And that's what I do. Years ago, uh, when I first started doing this, before I really knew John very well, I, I would I went and ask for you know a copy of all the purchase orders. Well, you can imagine how difficult it is to make sense of a pile of paper that's five or six feet high. Uh, it's just not workable. Uh, and when John explained to me that I could ask for the data in electronic format, either on CD or email to me. He says I ask for an email because I want paper the CD, but it's also just quicker. Um, now I have the ability to take that data, suck it into a database sort it, filter it, search through it, uh, total it, subtotal it, uh, export it to Excel, make graphs, whatever I want to do. So it becomes easier to, to, to get a handle on it. And, uh, and only recently I just learned uh, you know, to ask for some additional fields that I never used to ask for. for when I would ask for a check register, I never asked for uh, what budget the spending was against and what line item uh, in the budget it was against. And if you have that information, now you can compare what they spent for what they budgeted this spend. Let's go a little bit further. If, yeah. if, if the requester says that he wants um, a database of, of uh, say, the tax rate, <clears throat> sometimes it takes five, 10, 12 days, depending on the municipality. Very difficult to work with because you have to change the list. Could you offer through space technology to provide a USB device, a simple hard drive? I mean, you know and I know it's, it's much, much quicker much easier, less onerous on the municipality, and it's simple. Simple for the provider also, as well as the requester to put that database directly in. Right, and these days I can even ask for a hard drive, I and mean, hard drives are not expensive anymore. I can buy a, a terabyte hard drive for 60 bucks, you know, a two terabyte for 99. So uh, that that's another option. But I, now, for me, I use email because I own my own web server. I have no limit on the size of the attachment they send me. So they want to send me a 20-megabyte file, that's just beachy with me. It's going to come through. Not everybody has that option. But. What you're doing is you're giving them, by making a request on a hard drive or a USB thumb drive, you're giving them outs. You're giving them a lot of ways that they can kick up a lot of dust and 
and, and, and bring up a lot of red herrings. Like, for instance, they will say, if you provide us with a hard drive, how do we know that you didn't infect it with some sort of a terrible virus that's going to bring the entire man's value to his knees? Yeah, it's something like turn into a security They're going to turn into a security issue. So, but, I mean, theoretically, that well, argument's been accepted. You can say, and also the thing is going to be, we have no idea here. I mean, we've had computers in this office for 20 years, but we have no idea what, how to actually get this thing into a USB port. You know, <laughs> we, we'd have to hire a, 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 an internet guy, you know, to come in here. So they'll say that they don't have the experience in their office to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm using worst possible case scenario, uh, but and that we need to we need to hire a guy. But they would they could say you could say to them, I want this on a hard drive. They'll say, okay, we're going to go out and buy a hard drive. We're going to have to pay a guy to open up our computers and plug it in somehow and do it. And it's going to cost you X number of dollars. And what they can do is they will have to furnish you the information. They have to honor your request and provide it in the document, in the format that you want, in the medium that you want. But if they are able to say to you that, that you're going to have to pay the extraordinary or the special service charges, that it's going to cost them, uh, that it's going to cost them out of pocket. And usually the stuff that municipal counties and school boards buy usually isn't a bargain. So expect to get a big bill for it. That's the best that I can tell you. So yeah, I think you're within your rights, but you're they're gonna you're gonna give them if they're if they're predisposed not to give you the information or be as difficult as they possibly can, they're gonna come up with, with those types of, 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 of ways of, of, of making it difficult. But but you shouldn't assume that that's always the case. Yeah. Sometimes you get denied simply because they really don't know how to do it. And I can give you a recent example. Where I asked for a check register from two different townships in the same county. The one uh, uh, records custodian immediately emailed me everything I needed. The other one said, I don't know how to do this. And I, and I said, Well, uh, that's okay. I have a video on the New Jersey FOB website that shows you how to do this painlessly. <laughs> and so I sent them to the New Jersey FOB website. They watched the video. They, they emailed me back and said, thank you, that was so helpful. We, we gave it to everybody in the department, and here's your, your records. So sometimes it's just, a, you just need to educate them. Just, just for the record, I have good experience with the municipalities too, okay? But uh, I, I always go with the worst possible case scenario, because that it's, a lot of times I have not good experiences with them. So just to set the record straight. Well, that is the point that I was going to try to make, is that it is not always Say very often to a records custodian when I am having this battle, because sometimes they'll say to me, "You know, we don't have the time to, to fulfill these requests." And, and, and I, I'm sympathetic to that because if you're a small township and you're trying to get things done, and someone's making a request for, for a lot of records, it can be a bit of a burden. But what I usually say to them is, "Look, the best way to deal with this is take your most uh, frequently requested information and put it online." let people download it directly so they don't have to make an open request again. And I don't think that enough townships or government bodies are really taking advantage of the technology that, that exists. You know, one of the things that I do, I have a website called watchdogtools.com where you can download my check register database for free and you can download data sets for, that I have collected from various organizations, again, for free, and you can, you can search through that information. Well, I would love to see a day when well, instead of me doing this, the townships or the government themselves was doing it. You know? Sir, I think you've got a question for a while. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask, uh, in reference to requesting files, can you specify the format of the file? You know, not all of us have uh, servers or whatnot, like, you know, with the limited yes. or ASCII or something, yes. and do they have to do that? They have to try to convert it. I mean, okay. I, I don't put them through it. I ask for it. I can read in anything that they send. If they send me an ASCII file, I can read it. If they want to send me an Excel file, they can read it. Mm -hmm. I usually say I want it in whatever format you keep it in. 
if it isn't some proprietary format that nothing can read, that anybody's going to, I want it converted to ASCII, Excel, or some other format that is typically and generally available to consumers who have computers. You do have to be careful that you don't leave the door too wide open because, you know, if you said, well, I'll accept PDF. Use the mic. Yeah. yeah, don't leave the door too wide open. If you say to them, well, I'll accept PDF, you might get a PDF that's a scanned image PDF, which means that nothing in it is text. You can't take the numbers and put them in a spreadsheet. You have someone have to retype them to, to use it. Uh, so, you know, I will tell a records custodian about the video on the NJ Quad website, which shows them how to take any report that they would print and print it to a PDF, and that's acceptable as long as it's machine readable. But if it's an image, and I'll tell them specifically in my open request, I do not want an image file because I don't. It's the same as paper. Yeah, it's the same as paper, and it's useless. I just wanted to ask you about that, the flash stick. Can they actually, if, if they're downloading onto the stick, why would they have to worry about a file? So it's only if you're uploading to the stick, right? Well, I mean, if I provided the stick, <laughs> yeah. I could have adulterated the stick in some way. It's possible. But I mean, if they're only downloading onto it, why would something come in? It's possible. An infection is possible. I guess it's always it's not possible. Very likely, but, it's, you know, it's, it's but I mean, you could say, please go down to Staples, buy the thing, and yeah, exactly. get one in a sealed container, yeah. and buy it and put it in there, and give it to me. So I mean, they could, you know. Uh, there is the possibility that they could have a .exe file on that to initiate as soon as it's plugged into the computer. Mm -hmm. I worked 30 years with computers, so that's possible. So yeah. you, could, you could infect the computer that way. And yeah. to be fair, I'm a computer professional also. I mean, they could already have an infection that right. is looking for something you know, that's on this stick. So, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. But they could be doing that. You could send one that's back with their file. My next question is for John. John, with this 1975 OPMA law, well, um, we know it's a little dusty and a little stale. There's been discussions with Weinberg, Senator Weinberg, where it's going to be, you know, before the uh, before the assembly at one point, before the Senate at one point. Where where are we at? What's the roadblock on this? Your view? I don't know what the, if if Senator Weinberg has an actual commitment to have this thing heard uh, before uh, a Senate or Assembly committee. I, I don't know, I, I think that there's opposition to the idea of an Enhanced Open Public Meetings Act uh, by, uh, by some officials. I mean, there, there is opposition to it. There was opposition to it. I think they're afraid of, 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 of actually opening up government too much. I think that, I don't know, and I don't know what Weinberg knows as far as when this thing is going to be or if it's going to be uh, before, uh, before a committee. I think that what is important, though, and the only, regardless of what she knows or what's really going to happen, if it's already in the cards, is to find out, to get people to ask her or ask their local senators and their assembly people to co-sponsor these bills uh, that I don't, unfortunately, I, I wish I had that. I don't have the numbers of them. I could probably get them. But to ask them to co-sponsor these bills and to, to, to advocate for their, uh, their, their passage or at least to have a, to have a hearing. Uh, especially if I think that probably this would be a good project for New Jersey Fog would be to, to, to actually start getting people to make these requests, particularly in the districts from which the chairs and the members of the committees that will be hearing, which are probably the state government committees in both houses, to have their chairs actually be pressured by their constituents to co-sponsor these bills and to call them up for a hearing so they can be discussed. The vast majority of bills that are introduced in the Senate and the Assembly never even get a committee hearing. Uh, they're never heard. They just die after the two-year cycle. Well, if you can speak to what just went on with cost of copies and how critical that was, and and groups uh, like ours and just people started calling. I mean, I myself just called that day when I found out from NJ Fog that they were going to be voting on a Monday <coughs> for the cost of copies. I started calling my uh, representatives. They didn't even know what they were going to be voting on that day. But if you make a call to your representative and you say you're going to be voting on this legislation, you may not talk to them, but you'll talk to one of their staff and they will get back to you. I called three people, they got back to me, 
They didn't know, but they found out. And they knew that there was a, there was a citizen or a number of citizens that were interested in that legislation and that legislation passed. You can just... Yeah. It, 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 it's, actually, I don't have to. You just did. Yeah. Uh, but, but, the, but I think that, that, that some, I find the legislators to be surprisingly responsive and wanting to serve their constituency. Yeah. I mean, they, they, if you ask them a question, I mean, if you say, I want, they don't get as many respond or many requests as you think they get. They're, they're not as unavailable as you think they might be. They actually have offices and they do have a staff of people. And it's good to familiarize them, familiarize them with the with the laws. They might not even know it's in the legislature. If you can say, you know, this is a problem I'm having with my town. My town refuses to do this, and this law would make them do that. This is a good reason to do it. I mean, they're, they're going to listen to you. So I think that it's a good idea for people to get that. I think it's actually a better idea for NJ Fogg to put on our website, these are the bills, right. this is why they're good, this is who you call and make the call and try to encourage people to do that on an ongoing basis, especially, again, the, the, the committee chair gets to decide what bills get called up for a hearing. If the committee chair decides never to call the bill for a hearing, you don't get hurt. So to find the districts where the committee, maybe your legislator is a chair or a vice chair of the committee, the very committee that will be in that, that's a very important ally to have. And, and I think that most of these bills, too, like most of them are just, they're almost no-brainers. If they get to the committee level, it's be very difficult to say, well, why shouldn't we have, like the cost of copies. Uh, the previous bill was up to 75 cents a page for copies, and that's a lot of money. But 75 cents a page, you get a 12-page document. 75 cents a page for the first 10 pages, 50 cents a page for the next 10 pages, and 25 cents a page for 21 and up. I mean, you're talking about a 12-page document, it's $8.50. And that is abusive, and it, and it dissuades me from getting records because I do this out of pocket, and I don't have I mean, that 850, you know, 850 six times a month. That starts to that's like you're getting into cable TV money there, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to so, but the, so the nickel copy was huge, and but and there was we're getting organized. It's another thing is so we need to be we need to get on the NJ Fog list, the email list, become a member. What happens is that you'll get on the email list, you'll get the emails. It'll say things like, you know, call your senator, call your assemblyman. This bill is coming up, and this is why we need to get the support. So we are very able, we are able to rapidly deploy. We're able to get information out there very quickly. If there's a court case that is beneficial, we're able to get it out to everybody quickly. So it's important uh, to get on the email lists and to, and to uh, I maintain my own list. Anybody wants to give me a slip of paper or email, I'm going to put them on. And uh, it, I, I try to bring people up to date on, like, this is what's happening now. So uh, communication is the key, and if we can have it where we can send an email request out and get 500 people to call their legislators right away and say, this is an important bill, we're starting to, we're starting to wield some clout. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know where the bill is, is the short answer to the question. I'm not sure. All I know is that I haven't heard it's coming up for a hearing. I haven't heard any sort of rumblings about it. And I think that it's probably, it highlights one of the things that we need to do more effectively is to get this legislation where it's being taken seriously by Trent. John, uh, and I know that the ACLU and NJ Fogg has looked over the bill and they have made some uh, requests for additions and uh, on the bill and they're trying to get a uh, meeting with Senator Weinberg. And Weinberg has actually reached out to NJ Fogg, the Jersey Foundation for Open Government, and the ACLU. Uh, but again, it's really, we've been doing this for all, over a year. What we really need are people like you who have, have we all have a stake in this, that if you get onto the NJ Fogg just list to, to get updates, but then, you know, people always say, well, what can I do? What is it exactly that I need to do to, to put this forward? Just call your call your uh, uh, representatives. That is that is so valuable. And again, if they start hearing from different people, two or three people call on an open public records situation or open public meetings, they listen because that means there's some activity and some energy out there in the public, and they will respond. And a lot of them, real, and there are some, and, and you know, there are wonderful, wonderful. Uh, representatives out there and, and public officials. But there are a lot that won't do it unless we ask them to, unless they know that we're watching. If you don't, you know, if, you, if it's under the radar, they don't mind keeping it there. But when it's over the radar, they... 
talk about one of the specific things that this legislation will do is, um, is and I, I, the mayor mentioned before, that they put their agendas up ahead of the meetings. That's a big deal. I have had, uh, I, there's a lot of municipalities out there that don't post their agenda until the very minute of the meeting. In other words, when you walk into the meeting, they will have an agenda on the table then that will tell you, or they'll bring it in a few minutes later, it'll tell you what items they're going to discuss at that meeting. That's entirely, it's frustrating. Because the, it, the democracy works best if the public is, is educated. So, so let's say that I'm not sure how soon Bradley Beach puts her agenda out. Let's say it's three days before, or a two week. days before, or a, a week, week before. Usually. A week before. Yes. That's terrific because you're able, to, you're able to, then you're able to remember the public and look at the agenda and say, wow, I'm interested in the resolution that they're going to pass. Let me read that resolution. And then remember the public and then come up and talk before the meeting to the mayor and council privately. They can call them up and say, I have some reservations about paragraph three in that resolution, and I think that maybe you should reword sentence three to say, you know, and this is the kind of valuable feedback when you have all these eyes and the whole town looking at this and trying to figure out that some of these towns are downright abusive. They will not release that agenda until the minute of the meeting. They won't even release it to their own council people sometimes. Some, and they definitely sometimes won't release it to the people in the political minority of the council. And they will, so the, so the members of the public that are attending that meeting are, are supposed to look at this agenda for the first time immediately before the public session and develop a cogent comment regarding some detail and bring it to the to the public body, and that's their and they're not able to participate because people can't think that fast. They need to, to, to and that's really a shame. But what will happen is the Open Public Meetings Act, the one of Weinberg's bills, will require that the agenda be posted a certain number of days prior, and they won't allow the late starters. Like sometimes, and I've seen where they'll just amend the agenda on the fly right at the meeting, and they look at the audience and they see who's out there. I say, okay. Okay, we want to bring this one today, or, 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 or the rumor that it's going to be a real controversial issue is going to be discussed at this meeting. So the political activists in the, in the town bring the, bring the cavalry out, you know, and everybody's sitting in the seat. They'll just take it off the agenda. They won't discuss it. And then three weeks later, maybe have 80% of those people come because they all get worn out. And they finally wait till it comes down to a dwindling thing. They say, let's throw this, this hot item on the agenda and discuss it at this meeting so we can essentially avoid the public's ability to protest. And that is not government. That's nonsense. That's abuse is what that is. And that's one of the kinds of things that, 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 that Weinberg's bill will address. And that's why, just for that, it's important to get this thing through. We, we had an example, sorry, but this is right on topic. Um, in the agenda, it said MOU, Mutual Agreement on the Resolution, could be brought up. Um, so I immediately said, well, what's this MOU? It's, it's, it's uh, with the state of New Jersey. So I knew it must pertain to the budget, you know, because we have a special <coughs> money in that great part. So I wanted to get a copy of it to see what the city was going to have to agree to, uh, you know, preferably before they voted on it. And their, their uh, explanation to me was, well, first you have to fill out the form. Um, but they said you deliver the form that night. I said, well, then I won't know what's in the MFU in order to, to, to understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we don't want you to have the MFU yet until it's voted on and passed the resolution. Because it's advisory consultant even delivered to the good change. Okay. Isn't that awful? Yeah, well, there, there has to be, there, there has to be, that's abusive. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't really know what to do about that, because theoretically, I guess it is. Is it advisory consultant even delivered it? Right, the problem with this stuff is how do you enforce it? Like if, if something's on the agenda and they decide not to talk about it, you're supposed to put a gun to their head and say, look, you got to talk about it. you got to talk about it tonight and you can't talk about it later. Yeah. On the other hand, if something's not on the agenda but tr the truth comes up and they talk about it, you say, well, it wasn't on the agenda so you can't talk about it. What if a member of the public wants to talk about something that's not on the agenda? Well, I can't talk about it, it's not on the agenda. So I, it's, it's a very tricky it's a very tricky issue. I know you guys are getting sandbagged. I know that. Mm. But how do you enforce that? Mm. I, I, very difficult to enforce. I have a question. Um, going back to the executive minutes that they, the sessions they go into, and of course, our people just pulled that last night. Mm -hmm. And their, their reason was that the state, and they're talking about road construction, doesn't want it out of the bag yet. Now, is that reason for executive session if it's going to be a state, <clears throat> excuse me, state road project? 
I, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe yeah. I even heard that at the meeting. I mean, that, that could be a good, re that could be a legal reason masquerading as a bad one. I mean, they'll say something like, well, the state doesn't want us to talk about it. I mean, there, there, there exactly may be, but there, but there may be, there, there may be contractual negotiations. There may be potential litigation. Mm -hmm. There may be, you know, some attorney-client privilege issues. Okay. But the problem is, it's a, it, there, you're not getting a, a professional response. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there may be a good reason in there. But it's not being yeah. articulated yeah. properly, which leads to confusion and, right. and now, this. My, my next question is, when they, when they put these <coughs> agendas up, like on our website, and the, the minutes to the prior meeting, like October's, can you go up there and say, during the November's meeting, uh, I veto the minutes due to whatever reason. If you don't agree, you think that the, the, what they've written up is incorrect. Can you, as a citizen, veto those meetings? No. You can you can you can protest. You can say you can stand up and say anything you want. You they don't. They can. They can simply say next. Okay. So next. If you want it to be part of the record, write a letter to the clerk and and say I, I want this to be made part of the record. And at many council meetings that I go to, there'll come a point where they just review correspondence. Right. Mm -hmm. Now it may be you know if it's keyboard, it'll be okay. You know reviewed reviewed and filed. Or, you know, whatever. Yep. But at least it's in the record. Okay. How specific do they have to be when they go into executive session? Well, that's a real good one. Now, the law says it's it's NJSA 10 colon 4 13. Says that they have to give a they have to give the general nature of the topic they're going to discuss. Now, I've argued that that means, and, and one, a couple courts have held, that that means they have to give as much information about the topic they're going to discuss as possible. I know that sounds, in general nature, sounds like they should be able to say something like litigation. The question is, do they have to say, instead of just litigation, do they have to say Smith versus Township, docket number L317-99? You know, I have had a court case, Judge Wow. And now is on the appellate division in Middlesex County, with the Mamba, with the Bond Road Township Board of Education said that he agreed. With my my argument was as follows: the word "general," as in general nature of the, of the topic, is vague because it can mean different things. If you're going to discuss litigation, "general" could mean legal issues. "General" could mean litigation. "General" could be half versus you know. Whatever it could be, consider a settlement agreement in Smith versus Jones. That's even get so it, there's a continuum of what is more and more specific. And OPMA also says that whenever there's an ambiguity in the language of OPMA, the courts are required to construe that language in the way that most gives effect to the legislative purpose of OPMA, OPMA, which is to give the public as much information as they need so they can adequately participate in the democratic process. So, therefore, since it's ambiguous, you have to interpret it in a way that is most conducive to the public knowing what's going on. And the judge agreed. He said, and he, he, he quoted a case, a cited a case, I think it was a Monmouth County case. No, I believe it was a Mercer County case of uh, the, the State College case. That, that whenever you describe what's going into executive session, what you're going to talk about, you have to describe it with specific, with as much specificity as you possibly can, without undermining the actual reason why we're going into executive session. Now, what I did was, I decided to take this on the road, and I went and I ordered, I, I opened every municipality in Atlantic County. I picked Atlantic at the start of the day, I think we'll start right here. I, 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 I opened them for their executive session meeting minutes, the, the three most recent executive, the minutes of the three most recent executive sessions for which you believe that minutes are available to the public in whole or in part. And for each resolution, for each set of minutes responsive to number one above, the resolutions that authorized the executive session according to NJSA 10 colon 4 13, just to see what they come back with. So I got a whole bunch of responses. I found 17 of the towns were in non-compliance, either with either or both. So I sued all 17 of them for the same $200. I got a lot of bank for my buck. And I served them all. I got a friend of mine. We went down. We traveled. I had a little map. We traveled all the way around. He went in and served all the municipal clerks. It was a great day. 
and we, we, we brought them, so we brought them, we drove them all on the court, and they were not happy. They, they eventually, most of them, 16 out of the 17, said, I, want, I told them, I want to settle, I want to settle, let's do the right thing, even if you don't think I'm right on the law. I mean, all I'm asking for is just for you guys to be as open as possible with your citizens that are paying taxes to you guys. You know, you just you should want to do this. And and some of them sincerely wanted it. Some of them acted sincerely, but they really didn't want it. The 16 of the 17, they all settled. There's one town that just wouldn't settle, and that was Port Republic. We had to go to court, and they lost. So I won one and settled the 16. But the settlement agreements, I wrote up this memorandum of understanding that went into excruciating detail on how they're going to make these, 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 these resolutions. And it said that you have to do as much as possible, you have to say as much, so even if, I said that even if, if, the, if, if there was a settlement offer, if let's say you had a slip and fall in front of your municipal work, and the guy sues you because he says you didn't pick up the leads or whatever you're supposed to do, and he's, his attorney submits a settlement offer to you saying, I want to settle the case for $20,000, you should tell the public that we're going to go into executive session to discuss. We received a settlement offer from this guy for twenty thousand dollars. We're going to discuss it in executive session. Now, he, you, of course, they can't. You can't hear what you're going to talk about in executive session. But remember, the reason why the litigation exception applies is to is to protect the town is to is to protect the town against the the, the, the adversary. It's so they can they can get and, and say how we're going to deal with this. The adversary already knows that he offered you twenty thousand dollars, so you don't have to hide that from the public. Why do you want to keep the public in the dark as to what the settlement agreement is? The only thing that you have a legitimate need to keep in the public is is the stuff that you can't let the adversary know, whether it's a contract negotiation or whether it's a litigation issue, and on personnel issues. Just because pers personnel is different. When they discuss personnel issues in executive session, they're supposed to release the minutes of the executive session so that they can, so that the members of the public can read them and figure out what it is that they talked about and essentially what they did to who and why. They're not allowed, so when they go into executive session to go to talk about personnel, it's not because they're trying to keep something from the personnel. It's because they want to be able to discuss private things about personnel in a way in which they're not impeded from having frank, candid conversations because the members of the public are sitting right in there like, staring at them. So, but that just doesn't mean that just because the thing is allowed to be discussed in the executive session, that the minutes of the executive session shouldn't describe essentially what happened. And they should be, unless there's some overriding privacy interest of the member of the public. Now, for instance, let's say that a person asks for a leave of absence because they have a dread disease. And that's discussed. Now you can't, you're not, the, the person's privacy interest in their own medical problems, and so that supersedes the public's right to know what those medical problems are. That, that makes sense. Well, let's say that what they're talking about is we're going to discipline the police chief because he fixed a ticket or something. Well, the public's interest in knowing that exceeds any personal privacy expectation that officer has. And so the higher up on the, on the food chain, these, these people they are being talked about, the officials and the employees are being talked about, the less of a privacy interest, at least that's the way I view it, is that they actually have. So you should be able to get the executive session meeting minutes with enough detail so you can see exactly what's being discussed. So if it's true that if you obey the law, town, and I can find out 30 days from now under Judge Lawson's rule what it was that you discussed, why can't you tell me right in the resolution before the executive session even happens what it is? If, if it's just a matter of 30 days, I want to know anyway. Why not just tell me up front? We're going to discuss the ticket fixing by the allegations of ticket ticket fixing by the chief of police or whatever it is that you're discussing. So, so basically, my feeling is is that they should, and I get them to agree to this, is that the 16 towns in Atlanta County are operating under this under under a court order that that the, the municipal attorney at the meeting is supposed to kind of predict based upon the person involved, the nature of the personnel discussion, whether or not. That will, the details, to the extent the details will be available in 30 days when the minutes are released. And then put that same information to the extent that it's reasonably calculable in the resolution that calls or authorizes the meeting to initially. So that is the rule that I think it ought to be. Now that's just my view. I'm not sure if any, any superior court judge will, will actually enforce that, but I think that's the way it should be. 
is the meeting minutes is answered with the meeting the, the meeting the resolution has to specifically tell you what they're talking about in as much detail, be it personnel, be it lawsuits, be it contract negotiation, without undermining the need for without undermining or putting the municipality in jeopardy or individual privacy rights putting out of peril. When they put into it, oh, if they in that resolution are they permitted to have a catch-all and any other issues that arise? And, no. Okay. And if they have it, some items specifically enumerated, and then something else comes back that was not enumerated, are they supposed to come back and say we're talking about this now? Yes. Okay. We're going to go in to talk about litigation. See, here's here's what I think everybody ought to do in their town to really to really to really drill into this. He sent them the open request. This I'll repeat it. The most the three the, the minutes of the most the three most recent executive sessions that you had for which you assert the minutes are publicly available in lower part. Two, the resolutions that under NJSA 10 colon 4 13 authorize those meetings. Now that's going to take a bunch of stuff. What is first off you're going to see is how recent those meeting minutes are that come in. Okay, so you're going to have a town like I had a town. That white, I forget which one it was Atlanta County. They, I mean, I wrote, I made this request in August of 2009, asking me, for, asking them for the three most recent executive session meetings minutes for which they could be disclosed, and they gave me some stuff from like you know March of 2008, meaning that you know oh we've had executive sessions every meeting here you know for, from March 2008 to August of 2009, but none of those things were even even redacted versions of those aren't available. Well, there's a problem there. Okay, so how up to date are you guys in getting these minutes out to the public? And then you will now, but now they're giving you minutes. Of, doesn't matter when they are, and they're giving you the resolutions that authorize the executive sessions at which those meetings are recorded. Now you get to look at the executive session session resolution and compare what they said they were going to talk about to the actual things that they did talk about at the executive session. And there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the things that they're talking about, the things they say they're going to talk about, and the things they actually did talk about. If you find that they were going to talk about one, two, and three, and they really talk about one, two, three, and four, you're right, they violated. They're supposed to go, if they said we're going to talk about this litigation and this litigation, and they talk about three things, what they should have done is when they that third thing came up, somebody should have said, oh, wait a minute, we can't talk about that because we didn't tell the public we're going to talk about that. Adjourn the executive session, go into public session, pass another resolution saying you're going to go in and talk about number three, and then go back in and talk about number three. Now that might sound like a lot of work, but that's what, there's a quote in one of the court cases that say the government has a, has a responsibility to turn sharp corners with its citizens. You can't play fast and loose with this stuff. This is important. But what you're going to find in most towns is it's not going to be like, well, you're going to be able to, you're not going to tell a correspondence between what they talked about and what they what they said they were going to talk about because what they said they were going to talk about is so vague but you can then go to the town council and say look you said you were going to go in and discuss legal issues personnel issues and any other things that you feel like talking about in executive session that's what your resolution says but when i see that you went to executive session you talk about this piece of litigation you talk about this piece of litigation and that piece of litigation and that personnel issue now each one of those pieces of litigation were filed in the Superior Court of New Jersey. Any citizen could go down there and just pull that file and look at the litigation. So why can't, why couldn't you have told us in the resolution that these were the things that you're going to be talking about? And those are good questions. They're going to have a hard time answering that question if they care. And but they should be that should be brought to their attention if they're doing that. And say something else. I have a lot of people call me from a lot of towns all over the state complaining about their. First off, everybody. Everybody's town is the most corrupt in New Jersey. They call me. Everybody, you know, Amesport, you know, whatever. They're all bad. Oh, Asbury Park, that's even worse. I mean, I don't know. They're all bad. That's what they, when they're calling people, usually what happens is these are people that have been asleep. They haven't gone to any of these meetings. They haven't done anything. They've participated. Zero participation in their local government. And then all of a sudden, there's an issue. They're going to build a swimming pool. They're going to tear down a swimming pool. They're going to cut down an oak tree. They're going to do something. Now they've recognized that people start showing up the meetings. They're going, they're doing something really bad, whatever it is. Now, they've been doing bad things that they discover pretty quickly for the last five years. And they've been leading up to this thing, and now we're catching on. Then they say, well, let me see those minutes that existed five years ago so we can now start to track how you did this and who knew what and when they knew it. And they're trying to do this forensic investigation of this corruption and conspiracy in the municipal government. 
But then they find out. Then for the first time they find out. There is no minutes. They don't have them. Uh, the guy, the clerk had them. He took them home with him and they lost them. His computer crashed. The dog ate them. Something happened with the minutes. Not the, or the minutes were so vague that, the, that they're useless. And now the record that they need to make their case is never going to be recoverable. So my thing is that even if you have no issue with your town, even if you think your town is the, the mayor and the council are doing the best job, don't let them get away with these shoddy minutes and, and, and resolutions that don't tell you what they're going to talk about. Hold their feet to the fire. Hold them accountable. Make sure they're obeying the law because it could be that five years from now there will be an issue and you're going to want to know what they were talking about then and you're not going to have it, and you're going to be sitting there with empty hands, not being able to make your case, and then they're all going to say, yeah, you know, you're right, that prior administration, they really should have done a better yeah. job on those minutes, but man, we're really sorry, but they just don't exist, you know? No, don't let them, don't let them get away with it. Go to your town, and before, it's like preventative maintenance on your car. You've got to go to your town, you've got to fix the stuff before it breaks. And this is one case where I've seen this happen, my experience is time and time again, it's like, proper municipal hygiene. You know, you have, to, you have to make sure it's being done all the time. So I would say seriously, guys, make that request. And if you find that there's problems with it, correct them now. What, what about, what if, what if the clerks told they have to do as far as the minutes? It sounds like it's whoever's interpretation is going with it. A lot of it is they defer to the municipal attorney. A lot of it is nobody even talks about it. And that's something that just, is, is, is like astonishing to me is that like I'll find a, a blatant violation, like something like the town council doesn't keep minutes of its executive sessions or something ridiculous, maybe not that bad. And I'm like saying, you know, you guys have an administrator getting paid $120,000. You got an attorney getting paid $140,000 a year. You got all these people with plaques on their walls and certificates of law degrees and everybody else all floating around. They're all at these meetings. They've been at these meetings for the last five years. And it never occurs to any of these people that they're supposed to like have minutes of these executive sessions. It takes some guy from Somerset to bring this to your attention. I mean, I'm not getting paid anything for this. Well, what are you people doing for your money? I mean, there's nothing wrong. So, <laughs> so they usually what happens is a lot of times the clerks are generally well-meaning people. I have run into very few evil clerks. Most of these people are afraid for their jobs. It's not, when they're not giving you information, more times than not, it's a reflection of the people behind the work. It's the administration, it's the town council, it's the mayor, it's somebody saying, no, we expect you, regardless of what they're teaching in clerk school, we expect you, if you want to be here, you put a lid on it. John, and that's, sorry, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, why don't we just take a few more last questions? Okay. Call them right here. We'll just get rolling. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go down the bar and see if we can get it. There's several, my friends. Thank you. What's up, Ron? Ron? You've heard about Nixon erasing the tape. And Neptune, you cannot understand what the tapes say. They are incomprehensible. Plus, you don't know who's talking. I don't know what to do about this. You cannot understand my expertise. You cannot understand. You can understand the mayor sometimes. Their loud voice. But you cannot hear anything else. Now, I'm deaf, but other people listening who cannot understand. What do you do about this? Yeah, you can bring your own equipment, but there's 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 nothing in OPRA or the Open Public Meetings Act or any other law that says you have to you know if you make a sound recording it has to be audible. Just like if uh, if if a, if a record if a record is destroyed, there's there's no relief under the Open Public Records Act for that. If a record is is missing, there's there's no relief. Um, if, uh, if a record is deleted or you know discarded, again, it's you know Oprah doesn't doesn't set forth this this huge paradigm by which they have to deal with the records. It's just just if the record exists, you can have it. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't say what the quality of the record has to be. It doesn't say what the record has to say. So there are, there are, there are, no. There's no rule that says they have to audio tape their meetings at all. They only have to be reasonably comprehensible minutes of their meetings. So 
So to the extent that there's no rule that says they have to do it at all, you can't request that they're going to do it in a certain way. And that's true. They uh, supposedly audio tape the meeting, and the minutes are made up from the audio tape. Uh, says uh, 
we, we have the right to withhold these documents. Uh, we don't have to give you any information about launch. Well, we may or may not have that right under the Free Freedom of Information Act. Just like Oprah, Freedom of Information Act creates this whole framework under which we're supposed to respond, and there's there's an exception. Who do you appeal that to? Because they they appeal through their own, but have to take the federal court. I mean, I'm I'm sure you have to exhaust your administrative remedies first. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah, then then you go to federal court. And and that's is that you know do they cover your fees or not? I don't know the answer. I've never. Uh, this is anything to do with that topic. What type of things do you talk about when you have comments from the public? Well, you, you, I mean, you have a, when you go to a public meeting, you have a person and a right to talk about whatever you want. Uh, in addition, under the Open Public Meetings Act, if it's, if it's a, a municipal meeting or a Board of Education meeting, they have to set aside time for the public's comments. Not at the county freeholder meeting or a zoning board meeting or any other kind of meeting. So they may, they may not have the obligation to allow you to comment. Now, of course, there's exceptions because, you know, for a zoning board, they may have a hearing at which the public has a right. So, so just, just, just because there isn't a right in the Open Public Meetings Act for you to speak, that doesn't mean that some other statute gives you the right to speak. But in terms of what you can say, as long as you're not disrupting the meeting or defaming someone, you can say whatever you want. Okay, now, like our meeting last night, uh, we had a, a lady whose husband was really beat up in the election. So she got up there and told them during public comment that they were, that they owed her husband an apology because there was nothing I mean, they, unless they could absolutely prove it, they couldn't. That he said these things or did these things, she felt like they owed him an apology. And the mayor immediately said, whoa, whoa, no talk, no, no politics, no, we can't talk. Now, what I what I do in circumstances like that, and it's it's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it, it's a spe specific situation, but when I have someone who who goes to a meeting and is otherwise following all the rules and wants to talk about something and they get cut off or shut down, what I do is I bring a lawsuit in, in Superior Court Special Civil, okay? And I bring it in Special Civil as a jurisdictional limit of $15,000 in damages, but your First Amendment rights are enforceable there. And why do I bring it in Special Civil? And I've done this successfully. I bring it in Special Civil because you bring it in Superior Court, there's a $200 filing fee and discovery is going to last, because, because it's a civil rights case, discovery is going to last 450 days. So you're locked into at least a year of litigation, at least. If you go to special civil, it costs $30 filing fee, $30 to get it served. You get a court date in 30 days in most counties. You're not going to have a trial that day, but then you'll have a trial in another 30 days. And so what I do is I say, okay, how much is that per person's rights worth? Is it worth $15,000? Know, maximum $15,000. Is it worth ten? Is it worth five? And what happens is you get, you get the other town's attorney, you get their GIF involved. I did this once where I had two attorneys. So you have one guy, you have Fred making $300 an hour, and then and like Sam with $200 an hour, and I drag him to court twice. On, on a case where their maximum exposure is $15,000, I must have cost them like at least five to ten thousand dollars in legal fees, because because Mr. Mayor told Mrs. Whatever to shut the hell up. He's not allowed to do that. Well, it's so sad because they tell you something, and you as a layman, you don't know, and you believe what they tell you, and then you find out later you're wrong. Yeah. And you think you're being fair, but you're not. Well, that's why you have to challenge them. That's why it takes. It's not for everybody. A, a lot of people are timid. Well, that's why you have to challenge them. That's why it takes. It's not for everybody. A lot of people are timid. A lot of people don't want to call attention to themselves. But you have to go out there and push the envelope. That's why if you're willing to do it, it's, it's important to do that. It's important to hold their feet to the fire and say, look, you can't push me around. I can talk about whatever I want. You, you sue them, you win, and that emboldens the meeker people, the more mild people. They'll say, well, I'll push, I'm not going to allow myself to push around because there's been a precedent set. I know what line I can go up to now, and, and they're not intimidated by, by this blustering of the mayor. 
And I don't, I don't take any pleasure in seeing the taxpayers have to pay, because the mayor is not going to cost them a nickel out of his pocket. It's going to be the insurance companies, going to be the taxpayers going to better pay on this. But I don't know any other way to do it when exactly. your rates Those are, are the being tools that you have. That's, that's, that's all that you have. that you have. So hopefully, what you can do is by having <laughs> one case that that, 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 and it will be in the newspaper, the Burlington County Times, that mayor is told he's wrong. You know, you can't do this anymore. What that will do is that'll that'll provide a guidepost and a bright line for everybody in that whole area. The well, Robert, that yeah. And I have the right to speak and I'm going to say what I have and, and it says, listen, but I'm going to still keep silent. It says right in the open that you have the right to speak of anything that you believe is going to be of interest to the members of the municipality. So once you open that up like that, you can't have some content-based where, where the only okay comments are the ones where you praise the mayor about what a great job he's doing, but as soon as you criticize him, you can't say that because you're, you're, you're being negative. I mean, that's that, the whole idea, this is a rough and tumble debate. This is, what, this is when it's working. Democracy is a messy thing. It, 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 it sometimes hurts people's feelings. And, but that's how, it's, that's how it's supposed to work. And the mayor has no right to do it. Can they limit you on how long you can Oh, yeah, they can set up reasonable time. They can say everybody gets two minutes, everybody gets five minutes, everybody gets, you know, whatever it is. That, they can set up reasonable time and manner restrictions. They can set, they can determine the length of the portion, and I think it would be fair to say that they can say a one person can speak once. I think they can do yeah. that. Can they arbitrarily just close the, the uh, public session? Not, a, not if there's people who haven't spoken yet. I, mean, I know there's some jurisdictions that say three minutes per person, maximum 30 minutes. Okay. So the question is, is that reasonable or not? But they haven't set a parameter. Well, I mean, if, 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 there's, if no parameter has been set, then there's no rule to enforce. They can't just make it up on the fly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I were advising a town, I would say, look, create your regulations. Have your regulation, you know, pass a resolution, pass an ordinance, whatever. And the ordinance would say maximum of, you know, three minutes or five minutes per person and one person per whatever. So, you know, they have to have an open comment period. So one person per, you know, each person gets to speak once. That's reasonable. Now, if ordinances are coming up for vote, then those have their own specific times. Same thing, you know, three minutes or five minutes, whatever is reasonable, and, and you know, you only get to speak once. Yes, ma'am. Can you give your thoughts on this recent news article I read in the Asbury Park Press, so it uh, took place in Monmouth County, where uh, I'm going to say that the mayor said, even though they videotape their meetings during public comment, they're going to cease videotaping. I mean, that's fine. Um, I mean, there's, there's no obligation to videotape. I mean, I, I've always felt that public agencies cause themselves many more problems by recording stuff than by not recording it. I mean, if I were advising public agency, I was telling them, don't record anything. You know, why? You're just, you're, just, you're just creating problems for yourself. Because if you misbehave, you're creating a record of your own misbehavior. And so, I mean, again, from the perspective of public agency. Now, now you guys have the right to record meetings. So just because a public agency doesn't do it, doesn't mean you're, you know, if, you, if it's important enough, just, just like there's at least two video cameras in this room tonight. So just like if it's important enough for you to videotape it, then, then, then videotape or record it. You're allowed. The Supreme Court has said you're allowed to, to record it. So, for, you know, from my perspective, as a, you know, from, you know, from, an, from a public agency's perspective of, of risk management, I would, say, I would say don't. I would say don't, because more often than not, you're going to be accused, you know, people are going to be accusing you of stuff, and then you, you want to create that record or not. I just think it sets up a real chilling effect on public comment if, they're, if their protocol has been to videotape the entire meeting, including public comment, and then they're stopping to shut things down during public comment. Well, how is that, how is that chilling? I, I think for other people in the community, a lot of times people come up and speak at a meeting, not just because, and, and these are, I'm talking about things that are broadcast too and are available, I mean, that's why they're videotaping, they're putting them on public access, they're putting them on the internet. A lot of times, I know for myself personally, I don't, I can make a phone call to the administration and get the information I need, but 
but that only benefits me. I don't have this mass media, so I get up there a lot of times and speak because I want the people in the audience behind me right. to hear it, and I want to see the viewing audience, right. uh, you know, those who take the time. So that is, I see that as, as decreasing the transparency and decreasing the openness because it doesn't get that, it doesn't broadcast that part of it as well. Right, I mean, it makes me suspicious. I mean, why are they afraid of well, broadcasting all exactly. the comments? Well, where did the little folders go that we were supposed to take? I, I, I owe you one. You'll have to. I, I gave them all out. I'm oh, sorry. How come you did that? They were up there for everybody. Well, okay. Thank there you. Well, second question: Do they have to? Um, do they have to have a public comment period? I've been telling them. Yeah. Yeah. They yes. Do the town no, town councils, and school board. They do. They have to have it. And school boards have to have it. Yes. In our town, they actually use the police one evening to do the stop the discussion. And it was one more word of you that you will be removed. And it was during a comment. A compliment actually was, was making comments. And I was responding to it. It was during the public uh, comment. And they actually called the police in. I think they're. I think that's an abuse of their authority, and I think they got to be hauled into court. Is what I think. It depends on the statute of limitations. How.